Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's uh, just after 7. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, move right to item number 7. It's item number 2, um, acceptance of the agenda. So moved. Second moved by Mr. Murray, second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Continuing with item number 2 is a walk-in period. Are there any walk-ins here this evening? Seeing none, we will move on to item number 3, which is a vote of the polling hours for the town election. Is Bernice here? Are we expecting her? No. Okay. Okay. Motion. Motion, please. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to set the polling hours from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for the town elections May 19, 2012. Second. Second by Mr. Danahy. Just a, a quick discussion. Bernice sent us a letter um, saying the, these are her suggested hours. Um, she said the, bo uh, the ballot does not appear to require lengthy hours for the election. There were, there's very... Um, few races going on you had to turn in your papers by yesterday yesterday and uh, all of that is done and there are like uh, Bernice said in a letter very few um, people running against other people so um, all in favor aye. Uh, aye. aye all opposed it is unanimous moving on to item number four which is a discussion vote of a uh, to award an ambulance bid chief judge how are you good how are you doing good thanks yeah, this is um, money that was appropriated in last year's capital. We sent it out the bid, and the bid came back. We accepted this bid from the company for two hundred and five thousand and change. Do you know what we appropriated for it? Do you know what we uh, estimated it would be? Uh, two hundred and five. We're a little bit over, but uh, I'll we'll take care of that. In my oh no, but we there. did we did project or we did allocate two hundred and five. Yes. Okay, so it was right on. And the only other question I had is, how do we get it? Do they bring it to us? Yes. Oh, they do. Yes, okay. they build it and they deliver it. Great. Any other questions from the board? Motion to assume. Please. Move the board of selectmen vote to award the contract for one wheel medium duty ambulance uh, Freightliner mm -hmm. M2 to not Eastern Rescue Vehicles Inc. of Syracuse, New York, for a net price of two hundred five thousand eight hundred seventy one dollars. This price includes the chassis conversion and options as specified by the town of Situate bid specifications. Second. Second by Mr. Danahy. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. It's unanimous. Thanks, Thanks Chief. Chief. Move on to item number five, which is a discussion vote of a one-day wine and malt beverage license and entertainment license for the uh, Harbor Community Building at 44 Jericho Road. Nico. Good evening, guys. Uh, it's a private party event where uh, my, I'm, I'm here representing uh, the person I'm on the application who I'd like to not name if that's okay with you because it's a surprise party. So I'm here helping that person rent the building so that we can have a party, private event. Uh, 530 to 1130, I believe. Uh, the certificate of insurance has been given to the town. Uh, live music inside the building. Beer and wine as allowed by the statutes. Um, about 100 people. Light food. I'm not sure if there's any other questions. I'm happy to answer. Any questions from the board? No, only that it, it's 6 to 11.30. 6 to 11.30? I Just apologize. Know, I that's wasn't positive about it. And it says here, Nick, a uh, disc jockey to play music. Are you talking about live entertainment or a disc jockey? I believe it's a live band. I can double check that. I think the band is Elbow Room. It's a local band. Is it? Did we, um, well, why don't we do the, no. there are two different no. ones. So why don't we do the, wine and malt and then we'll get to the entertainment one afterwards um do we have any other questions on the wine and malt so are we going to leave that name out then yeah should we not state the name i could put my name on it if you prefer i can sure. change that you can put my name on record we'll do that okay um and this should say 11 30 not 12 a.m it's 11 30 we'll be done 11 30 cleaned up and out of the building by midnight okay. um just so you know you know, a few of the limitations of the building are there's no kitchen. We know that, yeah. And there's, you know, the bathroom. Food will be brought in. It'll be on The sternos. bathroom facilities are minimal, minimal as well. Yep. <coughs> Motion for the first one. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to grant a one-day wine and malt beverage license to Nico Afasanako. Close enough? Close enough. For a private party at the Harbor Community Building on Saturday, April 21, 2012, <coughs> from 6 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. Alcoholic beverages may only be served and consumed inside the building. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So now we'll talk about the entertainment license. I think there's 
a bit of a concern about live entertainment and DJ in there. I know somebody else came before us earlier. I think, Rick, you may have been, somebody brought it up where, I don't remember, what's, what specifically was the issue with having live entertainment there? I know we haven't allowed neighbors. it. The neighbors. The neighbors. We didn't really the contemplate neighbors. that. That's right. I don't know, Kim, have we approved live entertainment or has only been DJ in the past? I don't believe there's been a band. Yeah. It's just been DJ. Well, we, I know we had a band when we had our Christmas party there, but... Oh, you did have a band? We did. Okay. I don't know if there was any other, Are but we, we did. you requesting here? Did you have a license? We did. Yes. What are you requesting <coughs> here? Basically band. the same thing. It would be a band. Um, I could certainly make... Uh, when is this event? Efforts to keep it, you know, to reasonable. And if you want, we can put it at the whatever side of the building you'd prefer. Are you basically worried about neighbors towards the... West side of the building towards the uh, yes. Okay. How many folks are you expecting? About a hundred, probably under a hundred. Um, well, if the boards is it amplified? Yes, it's not acoustic. Well, yeah, we've been through that. Acoustic can be amplified or not, but is it amplified? Yes. There'll be speakers. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. that's what you mean. Yes. Elbow room yeah. generally has yeah. 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 amplified music. Sure. They do do ac acoustically, but it's usually if it's one or two. But okay. Well, what's the? I, I guess we haven't done it yet. We could try it, but it, we'll just say if there's a complaint, then we're going to send the police over just to shut it down. Um, I understand that. We can. Yeah. I can abide by that. I don't know. And just do, do everything you can do so the neighbors aren't inconvenienced. You know, which I'm sure you'll do anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's not. I, I like to see this, and I like to see. You know, I think you guys know. I'd like to see. You know, maybe you know reunions. I know we haven't spoke about it, so hopefully this goes well and you know yep. continue. You know, my only thing is, if it's like a hot day, and you know, if you're lucky and you get a nice warm day and stuff, just be careful you don't have the doors open at night. You know, that sort of thing to help cool it down. If there's band mm -hmm. music going on and stuff like that. Just the plan conscious. would be to do the same thing we did at our Christmas party, which was to have the band facing towards the lighthouse, so they'd be playing the music that direction yeah. towards the ramp, so it's you know towards the parking lot on the far side, not towards the neighbors. Yep. Um, make sure the doors are closed on that side of the building while all the doors will be closed. Yep. If we have to open a window, I'll make sure it's at the far end of the building. Yep. Any other concerns? Mm -hmm. All right. Whoever makes a motion, just watch the name. Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to grant an indoor entertainment license to Nico Afonseco for a private party at the Harbor Community Building on Saturday, April 21st, 2012, from 6 p.m. until 11.30 p.m. Um, for a live band to play music. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? Aye. Seeing none, Oops. all in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Have fun. Thank you, guys. Item number six, which is the discussion vote change order from the Squashka Pond Sewer Project. Mr. Caffrey. Good evening. How are you? Good, Kevin. <clears throat> um, we've encountered an issue out on Musquashka Pond when we were grinding the roadway, putting in the sewer. One of the problems that we're running into is we are running into excessive depths of asphalt, which is causing um, a change of conditions for the contractor. Uh, basically put a package together showing the pictures of how the asphalt looks out there um, and what the calculations were and how we broke down with our costs and where that's coming from. So this is basically to answer any questions and look for approval for the change order. And I will say there is one mistake um, on my calculation sheet. It's actually 25,000 square yards. I get written 20,000 if anybody looked at it. And that's that's how it comes up to the uh, the value it is. Mm -hmm. Got my question. So the ah, go ahead. I, uh, I'm sure you, you the uh, DPW is on top of this. This is more a comment to the board, I guess, not too much to Kevin. But I'm sure you're on top of it. I'm sure you, you you justify this. But I wonder if we'll ever see ever see a contract without a change order. You know, it's just unbelievable. It's, it's just, uh, and I'm not saying things don't come up. They certainly do. But it's, it's, it's almost to the point where you get very suspicious when you do see them. I mean, if someone bids a contract at a certain price knowing, knowing very well that they're going to put a change in order in for $300,000 more, and then <clears throat> it, it, the, the low bidder all of a sudden becomes not the low bidder. When all of a sudden done, and I'm not saying it on this contract here particularly at all, but 
but I do will repeat. I wonder if we'll ever see a contract without a change on it. Do we? F I'm trying Is this to the first time we run into situations where it's, it looks like there's been pavement on top of pavement, right? That's why it's 16 inches down. At this location, yes. Um, throughout this area, yeah, we we ran into a lot more asphalt than we expected. Um, on other streets, as we're doing other projects, this is the first time I've this is heard the first this time one come before. I, us. We've we run into some thicker asphalt, but it it wasn't to this extent. I mean, this is this is very very thick. But you're digging that deep, anyways, right? You've got to go down. No, well, the problem is, is what they do is they use. If you look in the sheet I gave, there's a machine in particular that they use that does the grinding of the roadway. And we spoke to the contractor, and, and the way the work is happening is they'll grind a section of roadway out instead of destroying the whole road, and they do it in sections, and that way the whole road isn't destroyed, um, and we can use it for traffic safely so it's not all rotted up and the road's a, a disaster. What happens is they initially expected to make one to two passes on that roadway to get it down to gravel, and they're making six seven eight passes with that machine to try to get it down to take the asphalt and what happens is the asphalt becomes pulverized and that's used as gravel for the base of the roadway again but it just looks like year after year after year it's it's increased with the asphalt thickness. isn't that isn't that kevin um when they put in the bid uh, do they go out and core it to try to determine the, the we depth had, of it and we do had they some say cores with the engineering company um in and, and they did not show the asphalt to this thickness the part of the thing with the cores is what we were looking for is actually not the thickness of the asphalt, but where the ledge is actually located. So to see if there'd be ledge where the pipe is going to hit it. The only reason why I'm asking is, isn't that just, and I haven't seen the contract or I haven't reviewed the contract thoroughly, but wouldn't that be um, a part of their, they bid on it, that's their problem. Since it's not four inches in, in depth, it's at 16, they have to take on that responsibility. Number two, even if they do take that reclaimed asphalt, don't they take that and reprocess it and sell it? So they're also getting a benefit out of, out no, of that No, not asphalt? really, because um, where you pay for that material is, is in the trucking. If you have to haul that material off, it, it's, it's more expensive to truck. And we took that into consideration when we when we did our um, negotiations with the contractor on how much was there and, and what the value was. But uh, to John's point, to Joe's point, um, we had several consultants working for the town previously that seemed to have change orders that were more than the original value of the contract that wasn't permissible and they no longer have not since worked for the town. Um, the second piece, though, relative to this one is that the engineer is separate from the bidder who's actually doing the work, um, should have known to some degree of exactly to your point, and Kevin actually reconciled with them today for an adjustment in their overall payment as a result of that, because what you said is exactly right. Um, the <coughs> fill is actually going right back into the project, so like you said, it's not being trucked. So that, that's not a problem there. And the work has to be done anyway, and that's the change orders to allow Albanese to do that because they bid based on the debt. But he was in contact with the engineering group <coughs> today, and there's a, um, a cost reconciliation factor that's coming back to the okay. town. From the engineer. From the engineer. Mr. Mark? So the net net's less than this change order? I don't want to know. I don't need to know no. how much off the top. No, of that, the, the net will come. The seven million dollar project. So. Yeah, right. The there's some come cover. Back. Yeah. There's some recovery on the yes. engineering side. There is recovery. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The next question I had was: Has the um, has this particular removal have they exceeded their contingency? No, we had a two hundred seventy-four thousand dollar contingency, and this is a two hundred thousand not to exceed. So we're still within our contingency value. Okay. Plus the net from the engineering part. Right. <coughs> Just. If you can just explain that. So at this point, we wouldn't have any additional expenditure because it's in the contingency number? No, I think we need authorization to go into we the We need authorization to go into the contingency. When we did the estimate, okay. we carried an extra 5%, which was right. $274,000. Um, for instances like this, because um, it, as you were saying, Joe, I'd, I'd love to have a contract without any change orders, but it does seem like we always run into little, you find something that wasn't expected. Um, and if, if we went to a court of law against the contractor, they would win because um, 
But to John's point, <clears throat> a certain amount of that is the responsibility of the contractor. If you go out and bid a job, you know, bid anything. It would, it would fall with the engineer that, that put the plans together. Yeah, and you know, I'm prepared to vote against this. And, and, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> if for no other reason to send a message, the change orders you know, are not going to be given out automatically, like they have been for, for years and years and years, and I've been part of it. With a change. Someone came in requesting a change order, and we would just, it would be a two second item on the agenda, we'd vote it, and that's the end of it. Uh, this is a lot of money, $200,000. We could do it. Well, we just we, had we it was. We work awful hard for two hundred thousand dollars. We just had it was an ambulance. Yeah, yep. And it no. can happen. It can Two happen. Right and and, and uh, <sighs> but sometime along the way, we have to draw the line and say we're not going to just rubber stamp these anymore. Yeah. Because let's be perfectly honest. Let's let's since we're having this discussion. Many of them aren't legitimate. All right, and that's because we all know that. So many of them are just a way of of. of uh, Making up what, what, what possibly could have been a low bid or something. You know, I think the message has to go out to, to everybody that they're not going to come easily anymore, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Good point. One quick note before I, I pass it to you guys is um, this is the sewer betterment project that's going on down um, in there, so it is not a tax. I mean, it is an expense to citizens of the town, and I'm glad you're working on it, but it's not coming from the levy. It's coming from a betterment that will be charged to all the people that are in um, the area that sewer's going in. And it is still within the contingency, so the estimate that we were kind of going on included, you know, that number in it. Correct. So it's, it included, we're not quite about in the realm yet, but still, to Joe's point, um, there's a little bit of padding. Um, Sean, did you? Sean, let first. Rick, go first. Rick, go ahead. Well, Sean, you were first. That's all right. Well, you go yeah, first. so for me, I just want to make sure I understand this, though. And Joe, I'm not disagreeing with you, you know, at all. But for me, um, these contractors, it's not their, it's not necessarily their fault per se. If anybody's fault, it's the engineer. And it seems like there's been some discussions with the engineer to sort of make them understand exactly what you're saying there. Um, but the Albany's seem to have bid on it based on what the engineering specs were. The engineering specs didn't get this depth, so it was the engineer that got it wrong. So I, I, I completely agree with you, but I, I would. Just want to make that clear. I, I, I think I'm accurate. My on name that. is Jim, and yeah. I, and I agree with you, Mr. Murray. But yeah. maybe the uh, maybe the contractor then has the case to go back to the engineering. I agree. Not to us. I agree. Yep. No. And that's, and absolutely that's right. where we have we have a contract with the contractor, mm -hmm. and we have a contract with the with the engineer. So this is for the contractor, and now we're in the process of going back after the engineer for it. But Regardless, if, if the engineer had it done I correctly. If the engineer had it done correctly, we still would have had that fixed cost to remove that amount of, amount of asphalt. So it would be, it would be the, um, the negotiated profit or I, however I, I that would work I totally understand, yeah. but I just, my point again, and I won't repeat it. No, we made, a we made it made very clear right. to them, yeah. and, and we're dealing with them. Mr. Harris? I just wanted to see what you guys, what you had to say, so I purposely went last. It is absolutely the engineer's fault. So are you saying that we're going to recoup all of our costs by going after the engineering company. This Where? is easy stuff, Kevin. The uh, thickness of the asphalt's easy. I was worried about the groundwater, you know, putting these sewer and water pipes around the pond. I figured they'd be underwater. That's right. what worried me. But this is why we have an engineer to do this. It's not like we took that on in-house and then, you know, Albanese, I was at the meeting at the community center, Pier 44, and they did a, you know, you know, I thought a great job, and, and mm -hmm. everything I'm hearing is they're moving right along. And I don't blame them really at all. Like everyone has said, it's the, it's the engineering firm, you know. And I th it's Weston and Sampson, isn't it? Correct. You know, I mean, they, you know, part of the reason I was excited to award the contract to them because they, they're familiar, and that's what we told everyone. And it's not the taxpayers, but the citizens. They, it's coming out of their pocket. It's still, it's, it's, not, it's <coughs> not right. You know, I, I could picture myself in that contract, and I'd be eating it, you know. No well, doubt. I, I mean, we're, have to we're dealing with the engineering firm, and um, you know, regardless, it's it's a fixed cost that we have to face to on the project. And then, you know, and then we're not. I don't know where we are. Thirty percent along the project. You know, it doesn't leave us anything else for, you know, water pipes. I could see that the first couple of phases. Mm -hmm. Now we seem to be doing that right in the beginning. You know, you know, in this phase here, we decided to do water as well as sewer. Mm -hmm. I just, Kevin, I I I can't vote in favor of this you know I, I think it's 
you know, Wesson Sampson's totally at fault here, you know. It's going to take them a little longer. They have to bring in a bigger grinder from Caterpillar. I see it. It's $24,000 a month, you know, but they're mm -hmm. expensive. Just, um, all right. Kevin, three questions. <coughs> um, I'm going to ask the obvious question, you know, why is the asphalt so thick? I presume I know the answer, but it's based on, obviously, layers and layers and layers of it asphalt. It's just layered, layered, and layered over the years. So when they first started cutting into it, did they determine that the first cut where they started doing the piping was 18 inches, or was it something less than that? They, they start, as they started going, they started, originally some of the streets, they didn't have that much. We go on Surfside, we're having two inches of asphalt. And at this point, they're still going to continue to cut. They haven't completed the, the full installation, Correct. right? Correct. So my next question is, the pictures that you provided are from, it looks like the fall, because there's grass and it's green and everything. So these pictures are from last year, I'm looking at, right? Correct. So are you asking us for the additional monies to pay them for what the work they performed or additional monies with an expectation that we're going to continue to run into that um, depth of asphalt? This is for everything. What we did is we went out and did test pits along Hadley Road, additional test pits, and we did test pits on Gannett Road to see the actual depth of the asphalt. So we have a good idea of how deep the asphalt is and which roads it's okay. on. Okay. So basically, this is to complete the project with an understanding that the depths are going it's to, not to max going that to value. be. That's the maximum that they could get in the change order. Okay. And right now, they are, are they behind, have we, obviously, we've paid them, they're not behind. It's just this is the money that we need in order to we complete it. We haven't paid them for any of the change orders. They're claiming to date that there is approximately $96,000 worth of work that they've done to date. Okay. They're coming back to when we have not paid them anything for that. Okay. Thank you. And have they agreed that this number, have, they, have you guys worked this out with them? If we, if we, we have agreed this to this number. Originally it was higher and we've worked it down to where it is now. I think one thing that, I mean, I think all the points up here are very valid, but I think the one point that stands is that this is the cost that it would cost to do the project. It's not additional work. It was just poor estimation. Mm -hmm. Because the, because they didn't find the right, right depth of the of the of this. They they made a break on the depth. Right. Yes. So, um, so it's not an additional service or an additional action. It's just costing more to do it, and it still is within the contingency. So, although I agree with you 100 percent on the change orders, and we really haven't seen as many, you know, lately. But this is, we don't want to, we don't want to see many at all. So, um, Could I, yes. Good. Go ahead. This is a final comment for me, Kevin. I, uh, how many times do you put, maybe this is a rhetorical question, how many times have we gone back to the engineer to try to recoup losses like this and been successful? I would guess very, very seldom. I can't remember at all when some engineering firm came and gave us money because they made a mistake. So we can say we're going to go after the engineering firm, but that's it's too late. We've already made the change order. We're probably, we're probably not going to get that money back. From them. Not, I disagree with you, Joe. Um, we plan on going back after the change order. I met with them today. Um, I don't think the full value is justified of the change order because the work would have to be done anyways. But there, there is some value in in that that we'll be dealing with the engineering firm for. Has we will be dealing, but again, but you know, it's you're asking us, not you, but we're being asked to come up with two hundred thousand dollars. Uh, on the uh, hope uh, of, of getting it from the engineering firm. We probably, we may not get it from the engineering firm. And, 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 well, well, again, I, I'm going to vote no, and again, maybe I'm just okay. making a point, but I just think that the, the, the contractor first should, at first should attempt to uh, recoup from the engineering firm who made, who, if, if in fact they made a mistake. Right, and, they did or not. and if I can address that fundamentally, the contractor doesn't have a contract with the engineering firm um, we have a contract with the engineering firm and we have a contract with the contractor so any work that has to happen has to come through us so um, it will come through us in in the past we have had some minor issues that we have gone back to the engineers and, and gone after mm -hmm. um, one was over at the harbor building the engineer had a bust over there with the plants and we went back, we're going back after the contractor for that, or not the contractor, the engineering firm. Um, and this is something we already have, we've already discussed 
uh, values for the for the engineering firm on this job. So we, we are going back after them. Again, not to belabor, Mr. Chairman, but you know this is and, and not that you meant that this was minor, mm -hmm. but this is not minor. This is two hundred thousand dollars. This is a lot of money. Oh no, it's it's far from minor. And, and if, if 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 you would come back tonight, come to here tonight and said we're looking for a change out of two hundred thousand dollars, and I also have a an agreement from the engineering company to to pay us back that two hundred thousand dollars. Then it would be a lot easier for me to vote for it, but we don't have that. We we have two hundred thousand dollars going out on a promise that we may be get something back in. So that's all. And I say no more. Well, sir, uh, you know, I don't think the engineering, the amount of their bill is anywhere near the scope of the actual project. So they they probably didn't even get paid two hundred grand to to do the engineering. But um, mm, Mr. Danny, sure. the question I had was, has the engineer been paid in full? Have they no, been paid in we full? We haven't paid the engineer in full. So there's an amount that we can possibly offset for. That's number one. Um, the, the problem in this you mentioned, it's called privity of contract. The contract's between the town and the engineer, town between the town and also the contractor. Between the two, they don't have a contract, so each party can only rely on going after the other for any breach of that contract, right. um, and which I fully understand. Um, I suppose if we decided not to vote to grant the 200000 we we're putting the town in a position of, of some form of litigation, potentially. Uh, the contractor, I don't know if they'd walk off the job, but they certainly at some point could say they're not going to complete the job or substantially complete and then walk away, and then we could run into that fiasco. Or they complete the job and then they come out to the town, which is in all likelihood what they would do, which would mean then we'd have to go after the engineer. Um, one way or the other, I guess it's a question of how the board wants to approach it. Um, I don't know how much, do you know how much is left on the engineer? What's due to be paid by the engineer or to the engineer? Patricia, um, do you know? Not off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. Um. Mr. Murray? I'm done for now. Yeah. Um, two points. Uh, Kevin, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I love the photographs. They absolutely brought home exactly what's going on. They're, they're well taken. They're in color. And just didn't want that to get lost. I really appreciate you bringing that thank forward you. because otherwise it just... You know, we're just talking inches, not something visual. So I and, and if that. I can, just these were older pictures that we had taken. We had records for the job, and originally the contractor wasn't really looking for this claim. He had done the work up to now, and did a lot of damage to his machine doing the grinding. And all of a sudden, realized the owner said, "What do we do? How did we do all this damage for?" And he said, "Well, we've been grinding 18 inches." And I said, "It's 18 inches." And Got it. It so escalated I, from there. I appreciate that. The other thing I'd like to ask, ask the board. Should we have Wesson and Sampson come before us so we could ask them for sort of an explanation of how they missed this in public? That might um, help bring attention to the fact that we're looking carefully at it. I'm not sure it would do anything. I wouldn't want it to be a 30-minute gripe session, but it might be something we <coughs> would consider bringing them forward. And I would think that, that, that uh, the engineering company, uh, Western Sampson, should have a conversation uh, with the contractor, Albanese, rather than with us. Well, no, Western Sampson. Western Sampson. With, with us. They have their contract with us. Oh, um, I'm just following what everybody's saying. I, mean, I really do. That's if they show. They fully uh, off. They, they fully <laughs> off yeah. offered to come in tonight and, and talk and you know. But um. I, I didn't think it'd be prudent because they would be getting into details about how they missed it, how they drilled, and how the drillers were actually looking for rock. They weren't looking for asphalt and okay. miscellaneous. So it is, like it is Weston and Sampson, though, right? It is Weston. So that's the that's the company. Mm -hmm. All right, Weston. That's all right. Weston and Sampson. Okay, good. Just want to make sure people are aware that's the company that made the mistake. Weston and Sampson. They've done most of the sewer work. They did it for the cliffs, and they did all the design work. Sure. For, and they've for done a lot of good work for us, but they. But Wesson and Sampson missed this. Right, right. Thanks. Just, Harris? Well, yeah, ju you just answered it, Kevin. You know, the pictures were taken last fall, and they, they've laid a lot of pipe, or at least done the, the trenches to do it, to lay the pipes, but yet the agreement with Caterpillar is just recently. So, and at 24000 a month, it's almost 10 months. These guys could grind the whole town of Situate in 10 months or eight months. So, you know, I realize they probably wore out some of their equipment, right. but why now? You know, and do you think that's a little excessive? If these pictures were taken last fall, one of the date, like John said, this green grass, and they just now have contacted Caterpillar for, to rent this larger machine. That's 
we had discussions with them and they thought they had damaged their machine from doing the previous work and it, they brought it in they did some work on it this winter and did some rebuilding to it and one of the things they said is we're not comfortable using our own machine if we're going to go out here if we're not going to be you know if we're not going to be compensated one of the options you can do for a change order is you can hire your own machine and this is the cost for it and remember that machine is going to need a um, need an operator and they have a mechanic that runs with it because those machines break down a lot they're, so that's non-stop non maintenance that's an extra 120 bucks to 100 you know 30 bucks an hour on top of the cost for that and we used our blue books to justify the values and the rates and that's broken down in this also mm -hmm. anyone else I'll move that the Board of Selectmen award the change order to Albany's Brothers, Inc. for additional asphalt removal, a cost not to exceed $200,000. I'll second it. Second by Mr. Danahy. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> All against? Aye. 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 Three to two. Um, it passes. Moving on to item number Thank se you very much. seven. Would you like West and Sampson to come in? No, not at this point. We'll let you know. Um, this is a discussion and vote for the Hawker Pedal License Renewals. Again, I want to thank uh, Kim and her group for pulling all this stuff together. Last meeting, we had a full discussion on the change in the policy for handling this stuff, and now this is the meeting where we're going to start um, actually allocating and handing out some of these um, licenses. So we'll go. Kim, you, you can kind of lead the discussion from there, too, if, if you need to. We'll go one by one. Um, actually, the first one is for three of them. And these are, are these three um, ice cream trucks? Yes, mobile units. So, and all these people were on with us last year as well. Yes. And we, and in the policy, we agreed to have four. Yes. And there's three here, okay. Any questions on? Had we any complaints about any of these? I haven't heard any. They seem to all operated safely and successfully and delivered good products to our citizens and all this sort of thing. Can we regulate music? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of them drives me absolutely crazy hearing it in the neighborhood. Uh, Gets the song in your head? I hadn't thought of that last week, but now I'm thinking maybe our policy should have had music. Music to be approved by John Denny. <laughs> I have no further Any questions. other discussions on the, uh, I agree with you. Um, also, uh, known as is one of the people that may actually just got a license from us last week to take over yeah, our right, right. What was the old place? Right in the movie theater. Yeah. So, uh, move the board of selectmen vote to renew the following Hawker Peddlers license for 2012. <coughs> South Shore Refreshments LLC doing business as Dell's Lemonade, known as Homemade, and Zach's Ice Cream, in accordance with all regulations set forth in the new Hawker Peddlers policy number 53-12. Second. Can, uh, Quick, second by Mr. Danny for the discussion. I think we should just add in there um, with approval from the Board of Selectmen and the police in terms of where they're um, stopping to vend. Is that, does that need to be said here? Or is that in the policy? I think it's pretty clear in the policy. Okay. Um, and that was um, uh, done by our, um, our traffic enforcement officer, um, Mark Thompson. On um, page two of actually, I'm, I apologize. I don't think you have the policy, to do, but it's he lists all the streets where vending um, should not take place by ice cream or frozen treat vendors because it's unsafe to park anywhere along the length of those roadways. So I think that's pretty clear. Um, so maybe something along some some legalese at the discretion of us to change. Isn't that if in we the want to add another street or something. That's in, that in the policy already. That in the policy. The policy yes. says yeah. the board. Okay. For, so for the motor motor vehicles, I think it's pretty. Okay. Clear. Great. So I'll just leave it as, as written in red. Great. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. The second one um, is uh, dealing with a license for Paul Crowley. I think Mr. Crowley is in the audience tonight. And this is for the signs um, that he sells at the end of Cole Parkway. He's been doing it for how many years? Fifteen. Fifteen years. Wow. Um, so this is not a food situation. This is just a, uh, a vending situation. Um, let me just grab your sheet here. 
So this is to sell lettered uh, uh, quarter board signs from the truck. He parks them right at the end there across from Maria's um, on Saturdays and Sundays from 8 to 4 from June 1st to October 1st. Just question. Today? I noticed in the application it was saying Saturday and Sunday of Heritage, Heritage Days weekend. Is that something new? Or I know the other vendors usually have to go through it, it, the Heritage Days. The difference was that the uh, Heritage Day weekend hours were lengthened. Other than that, I think everything else stands as. It's, it's the same as that. Now they have to go through the process of getting the state going through that anyway. So. No, what I'm saying is everybody else who does it for Heritage Days um, has to, usually has to go through Heritage Days, I thought. I thought that was part of the policy. He already had a pre, he, he's pre already got existing. An existing license to yes. be there. Okay. Do you do that from where? Right? From the state or are you us. saying or from us? Yeah. For Heritage Days. Okay, so we're basically saying grandfathering. Mm -hmm. Right, because he just, he's been doing it every year during Heritage I only ask that because yeah. when we yeah. start grandfathering on one, that means you can't turn around and say we're not going to grandfather for other people. Okay. So are you suggesting that they should go th just through the same vending process that everybody else does for Heritage Days? Heritage Days, I think the other was St. Patrick's Day, and I forgot what the other fourth one was, the third one was. There was another one. So do you Carnival. talk to, do you talk to that committee when they're setting up all their vendor booths for Heritage we, Days? We don't go down where all the vendors are. Right. We're separate from them. Right, you're kind of on the outskirt of yeah. where it starts. I have no, I, it, to me, all I'm saying is you set the precedent for grandfathering, so now if you're saying grandfathering, whether it's this uh, applicant, any other one that's come before us, we grandfather. Well, let's say we don't grandfather them. What would they have to do differently? Then they'd probably have to go to Heritage Days and say, this is what we'd like to do, and, and <coughs> probably apply through Heritage Days, because that's the Heritage Days menu. So that's the question, yes. to John. You mean with grandfathering for Heritage Days, not any applicant that comes before us? Or, or no, I, I would say for him, he's got grandfathered sta status because he's been there before for the past years. And I'm not saying no to that. Yep. But I'm saying if any of these other applicants who have been grandfathered in other locations are saying they want to be back in those locations, they're going to say, well, then if he's been grandfathered because he's been there prior to our policy as of last week, then why shouldn't I be grandfathered? Uh, I'm going to get right to it. And we're I talking may, about Humrock is what I'm I saying. May, we're going to get to may. the issue of Humrock saying they want to be grandfathered. grandfathered for, for, for heritage days. Right. Just for a particular event. I would have to respectfully disagree. I mean, I don't think we... Then what are we even talking about? Just let everyone go back to exactly where they were last year. I mean, well, I waste time here tonight, and I don't oh. think that's what we want to do. I think we want to make sure that we, we, we locate these uh, vendors in a place that's best for them in the town. I don't think John's saying not to let them go there. I think he's just saying just go through the process that any other vendor from Heritage Days would just go to the chamber right. and say, we want to vend here. On Heritage Days. On Heritage Days. Yeah. Uh, Heritage just on Heritage, Heritage Days. Day. Only Heritage Days. Oh, just on Heritage Days. Yeah. Correct. Or St. Patrick's Day, or what was the third? Okay. I, I missed something. The, the, I'm um, sorry. I thought the Carnival. 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 I
Well, St. Patrick's Day, throw that out because so this how application. Does, how does Hunter Rock enter into that? If it only pertains to Heritage Days and how does that pertain to Hunter Rock? I, don't I think conceptually. Yeah. It, it, what I'm saying is if we're going to grandfather, even if it's one day, because the policy says for any hawker peddler who comes in today, no, who hasn't done it in the past, then for any of the, and they're going to be competing with Heritage Days or St. Patrick's Day or, or uh, the Carnival, they need to go, and I don't have the policy in front, but they need to get permission during that time, I believe, right, Kim? Something to that effect. All I'm saying, Joe, is, is that I'm not saying no to grandfathering. I'm just saying that once you set a precedent on precedent for grandfathering now you're, you're going to have to delineate between a one-day grandfathering because that's what they used to do versus somebody who's going to say shortly I was there for two years in a row shouldn't I be grandfathered now you're going to tell me no that's what I'm that's what I'm anticipating and I'm just trying to say trying to be consistent to some degree and um, that's my fear but I again I, 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 I I'm more than happy to support Mr. Crowley to be able to, s to sell the signs. I'm, that's not the issue. But I want to get the issue squared away before we want to. I agree. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't consider uh, what we're doing with Mr. Crowley grandfathering him in. I think that it's, it's, he's been there for Heritage Days for 16 years. Uh, he didn't need permission from the chamber for 16 years. And, uh, and we're not down on the main street where, I mean, they're, where they're it's all cordoned off for that. Varies than they are the, the, the heritage days. And there's nobody else down at uh, where we are. I mean, I never considered uh, them part of heritage days. I just never did. But maybe I was. We, that's our usual weekend. Yep. You know? Mr. Moore, just a, two questions. So, why does your application and again this is just for clarification I'm okay with you all right but why does the application itself then even mention heritage days why not be just all weekends well, because it's longer longer hours okay so eight to four on regular weekends for all weekends except heritage days eight to six heritage okay. day weekend allows me to go to a six. I'm with you no I got you I just wanted to make sure so that's it's not like you wouldn't be there anyways. You're just asking for a two-hour extension. Extra time, yeah. Okay. Next question I had for you was, or for the board, or somebody. <laughs> um, that whole area has been reconfigured with the Harbor Walk. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to make sure that the location that you go, which may or may not be the exact precise spot where you've been set up, because the configuration has changed. Maybe the configuration change affects where you go Maybe it doesn't, but I just want to make sure that it doesn't block or impede visually or physically. I know you're not going to put it right in the middle of the sidewalk, obviously. But I just want to make sure that the, because that's been reconfigured, that where you set up is still appropriate and doesn't um, decrease the um, uh, decrease the gains that we've all invested in that by putting the harbor walk there. Oh, it's just a stone wall going up right now, right? Yeah, yeah, you can't block the sidewalk. Can't block the <laughs> sidewalk. No, you can't block the sidewalk. But also, you know, you it's a stone wall that's being made. There's a so uh, hanging nice area on the stone wall. Make sure that yeah. you don't detract from that. Can't do that. Okay. So just please keep that in mind. So Ms. other than that, I'm fine. Ms. Burbank. Ann Burbank, Penny Chris Rowe. I've been involved in the Heritage Days for a good number of years, as you all know. Um, and Heritage Days was back at least 30, if not 40 years. Um, the signs have been there for quite some time. There have been some issues, and the selectmen 15, 16 years ago decided that they're there. We gave them permission. They're outside the scope of Heritage Days, and that's that's how it has been for the last. I don't consider consider it to be a grandfathered vendor. They're just there every weekend. They have become an institution, if you will. I, I can understand Mr. Danahy's concerns. For example, Dell's Lemonade. Um, they have a Hawker Peddler's license, but they also come and vend at Heritage Days. So you know, they are part of our food court, along with other vendors as well. So it, it gets, it's not a question of being grandfathered, I don't think. But then again, you know, there's room for everybody. Um, I think maybe what we can do is just say that Heritage Days is, and I don't know my directions very well, but from the from the entrance of Cole Parkway down Front Street, so that they maybe wouldn't be in that border. Right. 
you know, right. if we just you know, on, go on the assumption that that's the delineation of Heritage Days, not to the east of that or Motion. west. west yeah. Great. Move the board select and vote to renew the Hawker Peddler's license for Paul G. Crowley for 2012 in accordance with all regulations set forth in the new Hawker Peddler's policy 53-12 and a location to be coordinated with the Citrus Police Department's traffic enforcement officer. Okay. So Sorry. just, go ahead. Sorry. Second. Second by Mr. Danny. Um, the only thing we want to add in, there's just a little bit of confusion on this, that the location is going to be coordinated with the uh, traffic officer as well as the board of select. The policy includes that. Policy requires approval from the Board of Selectmen and, mod and can be modified by the Board of Selectmen. So doesn't but the Board they, of Selectmen include these, all that? They're inside of the, um, they're inside of the 300 foot radius. So we're not telling them where to go, but we're saying that when the location is set, the police department's gonna decide that it's safe and we're gonna decide that that's the spot, just for the same reason you brought up with the pocket park there, that that's a place that we want it to be. Okay. So just and the board so just of so procedurally, if I modify that motion and add on, and the approval of the board of selectmen, I think so. As to the final location, yeah. that means they need to come back to us or yeah. run it through Tricia or. Well, at some point they're going to pick their spot, and, or, do, or do we t tell them the spot right now? Is it? I don't know. It's so right. I'm asking. We have it. <laughs> yeah, you have. It. Yeah. So that, at that spot, like, do, uh, do we have to specifically say the spot right now because it's inside the parameter? Contingent on approval by the traffic enforcement officer right. and the selectmen's office. And this, uh, correct. So at the end, I would say uh, tra traffic enforcement officer and the selectman's office. Right. Okay. Second that again. Um, for the discussion, Thank all you. in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Good luck. Um, item number three, which is the Hot Dog Express, JP's Hot Dog Express. Um, this is on Rebecca Road. Oh, no, the person lives on Rebecca Road. They usually out at the lighthouse. At the lighthouse. Okay, so that. <coughs> Bless you. Again, I guess just so we get yes, clarity yeah. in what we're doing here, I think they're probably within the 300 foot. They're not from the store down there in San Jose? No. Okay, no. so then there's fine. no. That's fine. Yeah. If they're not within 300 feet, then it doesn't matter. Right. Any discussion on this one? Just when he can sell. Hot dogs whenever he wants. There's no time frame, or that's in the policy. In the policy. That starts in April and ends. No, uh, but times, October. days of the week, where the other one had days of the week going. I know Thursdays a, a big night farm, along with weekends. But Kim, do you have a copy of the policy? I do. It's October um, through April. Is it from 11 9 to 11 a.m.? Yeah. 11 to 8. It is, it is seven days a week that probably should be. So April to October. That's all right. Because I think what you have to do when you make that motion is state the location. Like you have to say, thank you, Kim. You know, as you yep. listed six of them here. Yep. On a motion? Yes. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the Hawker Peddler's license for JP's Hot Dog Express for 2012 in accordance with all the regulations set forth fourth the new Hawker Peddlers policy number 53-12 uh, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. seven days a week and the location located at Lighthouse Park uh, parking lot uh, and to be coordinated with the Situa Police Department's Traffic Enforcement Office as well as the Board of Selectmen's Office. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Um, item number four now is for the renewal of uh, beach buns. Sheila Matthews, DBA Beach Buns, and this is the Hummer Rock one. Excuse me, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Uh, I spoke with the applicant this afternoon, and she would like to defer this uh, to another meeting. She wants, she knows what's being recommended as far as the parking lot is concerned and she'd like to look at other locations in the Hummer Rock area that might be outside of the 300 foot radius. I've offered to go over the um, GPS uh, picture that we have um, with her uh, and also that Officer Thompson may join us as well and then we'll bring it back to the board for consideration. She can also obviously come within the 300 foot radius and, and put that proposal to us. Yes. So there may, 
there may be another spot that she likes better right. that we would find acceptable. She does understand that, but she wasn't ready to come forward with that. Right. So we will move on to item number five. five which is the um, Ellen DeLuca DBA uh, Stellwagen Franks. And this one is, <clears throat> on this one there's been a few changes in terms of what they're selling. And there's actually two locations listed on Cole Parkway and on the athletic fields. So I think what we would do, I think what we discussed last time that we would in one location and then we should discuss the items that they're selling because if they want to be in Cole Parkway, they've got lobster salad here, which would be a direct competition with many of the establishments in that area. Um, so why don't we have some discussion on this before? Any if I may, yes. would the DeLucas have a preference of one site over the other? If you're going to be at the uh, town, town Cole Parkway, um, Obviously, there's a, there's a concern that you're going to be selling items in direct competition with surrounding stores, that being grilled sandwiches and um, lobster salad. Candy. I think you have candy bars, but that doesn't trouble me as much. Or have the opportunity to be at ball fields, whereas there aren't any competition to be able to sell all those items, I guess. Putting you on the spot, but sorry. You can come up if you'd like. Okay, I'm just gonna <laughs> um, the Bob fans is a, a much more limited time frame, and I wasn't able to do the ball fields except for the soccer fields towards the end of the season. Um, when Little League was <clears throat> in effect, it was mostly rain dates, and I was just starting up and trying to get the whole lineup with that. Mm -hmm. I guess. Stay at so do you understand that there are some items that you have that are probably not going to be approved tonight? I do. Just as an observation also, in the event that there aren't any other vendors, let's say towards the end of the summer or primarily in the fall when the other activities begin to pick up at the sites, you might want to come back to the board and ask for maybe the opportunity to be able to sell at those possibly. Something to consider, you know, not catching it at the beginning of the season but catching it at the end. Yeah. Just as a thought. As far as the grilled sandwiches, I was just looking for grilled cheese, not like paninis or. Yes, I am. Mr. Murray? Yeah, I was shaking <coughs> my head. Now he was just that was just to myself. I didn't mean to make a start a dialogue <laughs> without the approval of the chair here. Yeah, my my personal feeling on this is I think it's great. You want to be at Cole Park where I completely understand your concerns about the athletic fields being very sporadic, et cetera, et cetera. But I am not in favor at all of anything. Grilled sandwiches, I'm not in favor of salad rolls, uh, candy to, to, to take away from the uh, competition in the area. Um, I'm all in favor of if you're adding stuff, you know, to, to the general wares of the vicinity, then I'm totally with you. Um, but. I really want to adhere to the part of our new policy that says, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, basically you can't be near stores selling similar wares. And grilled cheese and some of those other things to me are similar. So what do you recommend you that, that you would take out? What, what would you let her vend? Well, the application here says, I gotta get new glasses, guys, sorry. Um, says hot dogs. I mean, I kind of, I don't, <laughs> me personally, whenever I go down there, I'm always eating fish sandwiches, so I don't know what else everybody else sells <laughs> personally. So I, I wouldn't mind a discussion of, you know, hot dogs are there. Do we feel hot dogs would be allowed? The next one on the list was sausages, grilled sandwiches, lobster salad. I know <coughs> a lot of people around there are selling lobster salad. Chip items, drinks, candy. I'm no huge fan of CVS corporate, but I know CVS sells candy and you know, people work there as well. Um, so I don't know. What, what do you? What do we? What's the preference of the board? Do I kind of like to go through these and find out which ones we want or not? Sure. One. Can I, can I just add something? In one second. Do you think that applies? I think it would. I think you got a problem with seafood because t Tony just pointed mm -hmm. out, and I, I said, yeah, I remember it. Um, mm -hmm. Is that um, you might you're going to need a um, retail dealer's permit as required by Chapter 130 of Mass General Laws. Mm -hmm 
selling fish or shellfish. I think you're going to have to get that to do I it. That deal from it is doesn't cover like doesn't I, I don't know doesn't yeah. cover like prepared foods. I mean, when I'm saying a lobster salad, I'm talking about it's already pre in right. a container. I'm selling it as with a roll that they prepare it themselves. So is this? So it, I think it bypasses that whole thing except for the board of health as I far as refrigeration. She is correct on that, and um, that fair enough. It's not very clear there, but it is um, fresh, you know, whole fish off. Of Back of a truck or, or a shellfish or lying in a or lying in a bed of ice, yes, sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And if I could just right. one follow up, I appreciate what you say about the lobster meat in a plastic tub sealed, and then next to it, you're selling them separately, the hot dog buns that they can then on themselves make the lobster roll. But that's too clever by half for me. I, that's basically a lobster roll. Sure. I mean, I consider chips and maybe even candy powder. Uh, I don't really consider that in competition with anybody in the harbor. Uh, I think you order a hot dog, you order a bag of chips with it, or a tonic, coke, whatever it might be. So I don't see those items as, as being similar, okay. even though they are similar. Uh, I do have a problem with that. When you start getting into grilled sandwiches, etc., you're talking meals. Yeah. And then we get into the restaurant competition with the restaurant there. So I, I guess I consider a bag of chips different than a uh, grilled ham and cheese or whatever. Uh, so I, I would have a problem with the sandwiches, with the lunches, I guess, if I can put it that way. I think that's that probably what they are. They're more of a lunch than they are a snack. And a, a hot dog and, a, and, a, and sausages are not considered. I, you know, I don't. Look, look at me. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, I don't. I consider that a, a, an impulse item. You're walking by. You're walking by. You get a hot dog. You get a. A lot of people can have a hot dog at ten thirty and have a lunch at twelve o'clock. Also, so I, I don't consider them a, a meal as I do a, a a lobster roll like they serve at the re all the restaurants down there. <coughs> That's just. And as far as the the grilled sandwiches again, I was I was just. Asking for grilled cheese, not ham and cheese. Just yeah. grilled cheese. Primarily for the people that are vegetarians that come to the car. You know, whomever they're with is fine with the hot dog, but they don't want that. They can't, they won't eat it. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, that radius that we had last week, I think the bandstand falls outside 300 feet, if I remember correctly. I think what Ellen's trying to do is a great idea. She's been doing it for a long time. Uh, she wants to expand on her menu a little bit. Uh, she, you know, Kevin's been a fisherman for many, many years. She has an opportunity to provide a product, you know, in a small quantity. Um, she's there in the summertime, weather permitting. She probably won't be there in the rain. And if I'm going through and I'm going to go to the Mill Wharf or Finns or one of those, any one of those other restaurants, which I do go to every now and then, um, <laughs> then I'm not going to go to Ellen's. But if I'm flying through or, and I don't have time, then, then I'll, I'll stop there. So I, a lot of people going down on the boat. I just think I applaud her for trying to expand a little bit. I have seen the amount of work she puts into it, her and Kevin, and I think she'd do the right thing. I, I, th I think uh, Cole Parkway would be missed by not having something like this. At least try it. Oh, she can she can try it. If she doesn't feel she's making it, then she you know cut back. But you know because that stuff has a, sh a short uh, shelf life. I don't have to tell her that. You know, she'll be if she starts throwing away product, then she won't be doing that very long. So that's just that's just my feeling. John? Just two things. It actually goes to both applicants with the hot dog vendors. Um, do you guys bring your own garbage can? Uh, okay. I only asked that because we had this issue last week and we recycle. Fair enough. I have a recyclable for cans. I've seen that for the cans. I just didn't know about the, the trash. Um, uh, to be candid with you, I have no problems with a grilled sandwich or uh, the items, <coughs> candy or chips. May make as, sense. Far as, the can, as far as the candy is concerned, I'm not selling candy bars. I'm selling like packages of fruit snacks and earheads. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's yeah, I think, for the kids. You know, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not our job to set your menu. I mean, you can. This is America, and you can sell what you want. You know, it's, but it's it's our job not to create an unfair disadvantage 
for other vendors and where we see certain items that's where that's where we're just going to base whether we give you the license or not i don't think we don't want to get nipped back and say you can't sell hershey's but you can sell three musketeers i mean that's not what we're doing here we just i think i think the seafood was where it really kind of crossed the line with some of us and if we say look just don't sell seafood then um then that would be it but i think we don't want to get too nitpicky. Uh, Sean brought up a good point that they are outside of the perimeter, right. so it's really either giving them the license or not giving them the license, right. and we couldn't just make it contingent on giving the license based on not selling A, B, and C, but we're not going to go through the whole menu and say, you can sell this but not this. You know, that's I think you have to sell $100,000 bars, or the, the chocolate <laughs> bars. <laughs> can, we just, can we just confirm that they're outside the 300? I think they are. They are. It, well, it depends on where, it's very close. It depends on where you put it. Yeah. It's by, like, one parking spot. Where, where you were last where I, where I was. No, I, yeah. I think you're out. Okay, that, that's very important. Okay. Mr. North? <coughs> yeah, it's, it's, you could probably get from my previous comments. I have no problem with this whole concept at all. <coughs> I guess my concept is, you know, our policy, once again, we put things in the policy, and, and then we ought to just change it. I mean, we have it's, it's in bold letters somewhere in the policy that nothing can be sold of a similar nature. Within 300 feet, 300 feet. Within 300 feet. Right. Uh, but we're potentially breaking that. Are we? No. Oh, no, I see. I was. Depends on where they put their stuff. Yeah. 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 I um, I was all set to approve, but to line item out the um, the line about grilled sandwiches for the reasons that Mr. Norton and I articulated, but if you're outside 300 feet, you're outside 300 feet, you win on that one. Yeah. So, yeah. because that's in accordance with the policy and we're going with the policy. So, and you know, just keep in mind, overall, I mean, I bought a lot of stuff from you guys last year with my kids and everything, and I, I like what you do and everything. I'm just trying to be consistent here. <coughs> but if they're outside 300 feet, they're, they're outside, outside 300, 300 feet. If they're outside 300 feet, we have no, I have no problem with it at all. Well, we do. Do we? Well, we don't have to give them the license. If you don't want them to sell lobster, then tell them. I don't give them they sell lobster. Lobster's not the issue. No, no, lobster. I mean, if there's it's, it's, any it's issue. Food. It's food. Yeah. It's lunch and food. Right. That's so, what I'm talking about. Right. So if we're going to stick to the policy, then if they're outside of the 300 feet, they can sell what they want. That's, right. that's, that's exactly right. Unless, right. unless we deny the whole policy. Unless we deny the whole application. Unless we because suggest we don't to like them it. that they take lobster right. or candy off their thing. I will say, I'm, I'm not. I do like the idea of one or the other in terms of. Fields or Cole Parkway. Right. Well, John so, made that clear. You're going to pick right. One. And so I think just so you just to choreograph where I am. So I'm fine with Cole Parkway. Okay. I think they are. Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> so you want Cole Parkway? I do. As John brought up, you know, there's only six or seven locations. So if after a couple months no one's taken the other one, come back before us and maybe we'll let you take the ball fields as well. In terms of the license for the items that she put on this thing, does anyone want to? deal with the license of any of these items for her to sell knowing that she's going to be outside of the 300 foot radius so no one has a problem with any of the items nope. all right then make a motion move the board of selectmen vote to renew the hawker peddlers license for ellen deluca doing business as stellwell and franks for 2012 in accordance with all regulations set forth in the new hawker peddlers policy number 53-12 and that the location uh, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. Uh, and the location to be at the Cole Parkway, I think it's Cole Parkway parking lot. Is that the yes. exact location? Cole Parkway. Cole Parkway. Um, and to be coordinated with the Situate Police Department's Traffic Enforcement Officer as well as the Board of Selectmen's Office. Second. Second by Mr. Murray. Further discussion? <coughs> I just have one other question. Because the the perimeter, the 300 foot circle there is so tight, um, there were times last summer where the parking was pretty limited, so I was kind of getting jockeyed down more and more, especially on the weekends. I mean, how do, what happens in we'll that? We'll have to look at the map. If you're outside, if you're inside the 300 foot perimeter, then we have to deal with it all the stuff that we've been discussing here. If you're outside of the 300 foot perimeter, then you just have to follow the policy. Can you place it up on the, on the ground, on the, um, the, grass. the grass? I mean, like you keep on talking, <coughs> I'm sorry. Put it up on the grass near the gazebo? Near the anchor? 
right location. I don't, I don't think anyone. I don't think anyone's going to go down there with a tape measure. If you have, <laughs> yeah. you have 305 or 295, I don't think anyone's going. To. Okay. I mean, you keep on talking about the safety officer and stuff. I mean, are they designating a particular? Is she going to get a parking spot to place it in, or something, possibly? Or is it? No. No. Oh. So, but if you're in a spot that he doesn't think is safe, or we don't think is the best spot, then we'll come to you and say, we'd like you to find another spot. But I think wherever you were last year, there were no complaints, so just continue as is. Because we'll hear about it. And as Mr. Norton said, no one's out there with a tape measure. But at least, there's at least a couple spots around the bandstand that are outside of the 300 foot radius. Yes. And that first, that last bill. Any other discussion? Vote motion, second, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Mm. It's unanimous. Thank you guys, good luck. Thank um, you very much. And we'll all figure out these policies as we chug through <laughs> the season. Good luck, folks. Thank you. Sell a lot. Mm. There you go. Okay. Moving on to item number eight, which is a presentation from the Pier 44 Options and Feasibility Study, Phase 1. All of you on the committee, if you want to come up here, if you can fit, or at least sit in the front row. You want kidding? While they set up, I just I'll, I'll take a second. Um, the committee has put before us a forty something page report, forty three page report with addendum with about seventeen pages of addendums and appendixes, um, and clearly. A lot of work went into this. Um, it's a very detailed report. It's a very articulate report. It's a very well organized report. It's a very well written report. Um, and I want to just thank everybody that was on the committee. It's, it's taken quite a while to get to this point. But I think after reading this report and, and dissecting it, um, it's worth the wait. Um, it's a big decision. It's a big asset of the town. And I. Uh, and again, I just want to applaud all of you guys for all the effort and writing and energy that you put into this. I'm going to take a second and just read off the names of the committee. Um, and if you just raise your hand, Zach, you can kind of grab them. Um, the chairman is Ed DeSalvio. Ed, thank you for your leadership. Doug Anderson. Doug, thank you. Ned Baldwin. Thank you, Ned. John Warner. John. Stan Humphreys. Dan. Colin McNeese. Colin, um, Audrey Reedy, um, Tim uh, Fitzgerald, and lastly, Gabriel Dorsey. She recently resigned um, after putting all the energy that she did into this project, so saw us through phase one of this project. So um, again, a very, very well-prepared document, and we'll give you a, a chance to run through it as soon as you're organized. I don't know, does anyone else on the board have any? Okay. Not at all. It usually just goes to the chair. We'll ask the chair, Ed, so we know your name. There you go. I did my homework. They took the time to write it. I took the time to read it. Zach, can you get that on TV on yeah. both of these? All right. <coughs> yes, I noticed that there's copies on the wall and whatever as well. He's awesome.
write it. I gave you the intro. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for having us this evening before your board. We're quite excited to be here. It's been a good 17 months since we had our kickoff meeting back in November of uh, 2010 to get the uh, ball rolling with this important project. What we'd like to do uh, this evening is um, not specifically go through the report page by page verbatim, um, essentially given the, the time um, that we have set forth, about 20 minutes to uh, summarize the different sections of the report and uh, explain our findings, explain um, in input from the public, um, ex explain our recommendations, and then we'll get more into the recommendation portion um, as we move into the presentation. And then at the end, we could have a Q&A session if you'd like. Um, I don't know if you've had a time to look at the report. I know you just got them last week. Uh, Okay, and the, uh, the committee members you've already met, we appreciate you um, introducing them. Um, now, the, what I'll start off with is essentially summarizing the executive summary and um, some of the use restrictions that applied um, to the project. And for the benefit of the, uh, the, the general public that's here this evening and, and listening on the uh, cable TV, I'll, I may be saying some things that you're already well aware of, but I think there's some important information that's in the report to share with the public as well. Um, as you know, the town purchased the property in 2010 with funds from the MBTA under the Greenbush Mitigation Agreement. Uh, the town negotiated with the MBTA to use those funds to purchase the property, and along with that was an agreement to um, issue certain property use restrictions um, on the property and this was a joint effort between the town and the MBTA. So there were use, in, uh, use restrictions placed on the property in order to allow the Greenbush mitigation money to be used to purchase, purchase the uh, Pier 44 property. And uh, we'll get more into that as we move into the presentation. The Pier 44 committee has been charged with looking at the existing site and the building and to study potential uses. We've gone through building code regulations, state regulations, town zoning bylaws. Uh, we've gone out and solicited public input through a variety, variety of means, through online surveys and public forums. And we've taken all this information, all the data collection and the public, um, the public sentiment, and have developed based on our own input and findings and what we've received from the public. Uh, we've come up with this report with three three main options that are in, in the report that we're recommending that your board further consider um, under phase two. Um, as, as you mentioned a little earlier, this is the, the conclusion of phase one, which was essentially a data gathering process, um, reaching out to the public for potential uses, and then coming up with these recommended ideas. Now, the uh, the primary uses of the property through the assessment um, of community needs are park use, maritime uses, and multi-generational community center. And we'll, we'll explain more of that as we go through the presentation. But those were the top three that were identified by the public and through our research as being feasible for that uh, piece of property. The uh, submission of this report is completing phase one of the study and the Board of Selectmen will review the report and then let us know what the next course of action is with phase two. And phase two gets more into the schematic design. Your board may ask us to per pursue further design of one, two, or all three options. And that gets more into the schematic design where you start looking at developing floor plans, elevations, cost estimates, and, and such. So we're looking forward to participating in that phase. Uh, for, the, for the benefit of those that are not familiar with the history of the purchase, as I previously mentioned, the town uh, purchased the property in 2010. The May 2010 special town meeting voted to authorize the Board of Selectmen to make the purchase. Prior to the May special town meeting, the MBTA and the town negotiated the use restrictions, which became part of the, the purchase. The use restrictions are also on the deed for the property. The, uh, the T would only allow the Greenbush mitigation money to be used for the purchase if the use restrictions were approved and made part of the deal. 
The uh, purchase price was $1.875 million, and it was all with MBTA funds. Now, for the use restrictions, um, again, which were negotiated between the, the town and the MBTA, uh, these use restrictions will stay with the property um, even if the town sells it. Mm -hmm. So if the town decides down the road to sell it, only an act of the state legislature can change the use restrictions or eliminate them. Now to summarize the use restriction, it was a, a several page document, but to summarize it, um, the restrictions um, include that the uh, town will use the property for public purpose of open space and land preservation for outdoor recreation by and education of the general public. This shall include but not be limited to access to the harbor front and a view of the harbor. Whatever activities are conducted on the site cannot interfere with the use in the view of the harbor. And as an example of that, within any of the, the, the plans we'll show you tonight, a, an example of that would be a, a, a harbor walk. Say you would come off of Jericho Road, walk down behind the property along the harbor, the waterfront, and come back out onto Jericho Road. That maintains public, public access, public views to the water, which is a requirement in the use restrictions. In some, in some respects, it's, it's easy for me to say what's not allowed on the property versus what is allowed. And we did speak with town council several times during the process. And based on town council's interpretation, the prohibited primary uses, and primary is important, the primary being the, the main use of the building or site, prohibited primary uses include offices, retail, residential, restaurants, commercial business uses, town business offices, and storage of equipment. Oh, sure. If I could just interrupt very briefly yep. here. That's a main point, and I was so glad to see you highlight that not only in your document but verbally here, because the one thing, one of the things I keep getting from people in the grocery store and so on is, why don't you put a retail shop in there? Why don't you put a restaurant? Why don't you put offices and stuff in there and it's just off the table and I just hope everybody gets that really really clear and I just wanted to emphasize that and sorry to interrupt but just not a problem. that's just off the table not even point of discussing period so thank you for for even just doing that right so far oh you're welcome um, towards the end of the pres presentation I'll talk a little bit about revenue generation that was also key feedback from the public on how to how do we generate revenue from this property in some fashion that pays for the operations and maintenance costs of, of whatever goes there. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of those options that become accessory uses to the primary use that would allow the generation of, of revenue, but that's, that'll be later in our presentation. Um, at this point, um, I'd like Tim to, he's gonna go over the summary um, and we're following the order of the report if you have it in front of you. Tim's going to summarize the summary of charge, the committee's work to date, the uh, repair work that we did out at the uh, at the facility back in January, and the codes and regulations that we evaluated. Good evening. Um, for many months, starting November 10th in, uh, in uh, 2011, since then, the committee has met frequently. We've developed a strategic plan outlining Pier 44 potential use options. Uh, we've used, we started using uh, available data provided by the town. Um, we got input from department heads, residents via a town-wide survey, um, public forum, various boards, business community were consulted. Main focus was, our main focus was space needs over the next 20 years. So this is not on what's going on today or tomorrow. We look forward to, uh, how to how to sustain this. The committee considered the square footage of the building for potential uses based on square footage per use type, uh, type of footprints, other existing buildings. We have pretty much looked at everything that could possibly be done on that site. Committee members visited neighboring community se senior centers, including Duxbury and Norwell, um, reviewed design for the Situate Senior Center, as well as parks with public water access, such as Nelson Park in Plymouth, um, <coughs> excuse me, in Hingham Harbor waterfront. So we, we tried to get as much of a view of the surrounding communities that, were f that had similar situations. Um, we're at the end of phase one now, and the report is all yours, and we look forward to phase two. That's the summary charge. 
Uh, phase two, the committee will develop further selected options um, depending on which, what we're charged with, and that's going to come from you. The committee's work to date. Um, I think we have polled everybody but the greater European community. <laughs> we, have, we have asked that there has been some substantial work done here, and, and, and uh, notably. Um, a website, we have a website with an email link so that the, so that the town, anybody getting on the town website can, uh, can go to the Pier 44 website. We've made site visits, we've toured the building. Um, we made immediate repair recommendations to sustain the life of the buildings, leaking, roofing, uh, windows that were not in good shape, sidewall, which is uh, shingling uh, on the water side that was letting water come in, and, all, and I, the town has addressed that. Uh, during our charge, we um, looked at all codes and regulations, Massachusetts building codes, the zoning regulations, uh, flood zones um, regulations, environmental. Um, we talked to all the town officials that are concerned with each and every independent part of all those different uh, regulations and codes. Uh, we talked to town council uh, through the chairman. Um, we had uh, an online public opinion survey, a survey of town departments. Uh, we had a, an information session where the public was invited at the high school. Um, so we have, we think we've touched a lot of bases in trying to, in, in, in a, almost exhausting what we could possibly, what the town could use it for. Um, existing conditions. The exterior is fair to poor. Uh, that's been fixed, uh, some of it. Um, it's, it's an older building on the water. It's going to take maintenance. Uh, anybody that lives anywhere near the water knows that. The interior is good to fair. Interior is uh, lipstick on a pig. Uh, you can make it look real good in the bones of the building what I consider the framing, and we have several code people on this that are actually code uh, officers, have been now or, or were, and um, we made g good, uh, we, fig we consider it good to fair on the, in on the interior of the building. The structure is good. The building systems, uh, which is usually the, a large cost, uh, HVAC, sprinkler system, mm. great shape, not bad at all. Once we got the old ovens out of there, it, was, it looked a lot better. Um, the utilities are good. The um, water frontage, fair. For a unique part of this site, the immediate waterfront is not owned by the town of Situate. It's owned by the man who owns the uh, uh, marina right out in front of us. And then it stops about at the edge of the building, maybe a little further you can see. Well, actually, it is a little further. You can see where actually the town owns out there. Kind of an odd situation. but. Um, storm drainage is uh, fair. Um, there is a concrete culvert located directly underneath the building. Um, I'm a little too big to go searching through it, so we, we figured we'd do that phase two, depending on what, what you guys, what, what you all want us to do. Uh, but that goes from the little uh, wetlands across the street out to the water. Parking lot is fair. There isn't a whole bunch of parking there. There's enough to work with for some uses. Um, shoreline protection is good. The harbor is a good uh, protection. Natural resources, uh, kind of poor. That's the way we. Uh, there's uplands and tideland areas. The upland portion of the site consists of artificial <coughs> fill. Um, this site has been jockeyed around for different uses for over its existence. So, I mean, I remember a small restaurant being there, not where that building is now, a long time ago. So, there's been all kinds of stuff. Okay, so that's pretty much the condition. <clears throat> the codes and regulations. Um, you name the code and regulation, and we, we, we looked into it. Uh, town of Situate bylaws, environmental laws, Massachusetts building code, accessibility regulations, AAB, which is the National Accessibility, Americans with Disabilities Act, um, fire prevention, very important. Um, and again, the town of Situate zoning bylaws. We looked at the size of the building, uh, what's required by the, by the uh, zoning for what's there, and tried to make a use that wouldn't, that wouldn't complicate matters. And that's about as far as I can go with it. Okay, great. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Tony, can I jump? Yep, one second. Can I Sorry. just jump in while, before you go on? I mean, you're the building inspector in Norwell, right? Yes, sir. All right. How does the building fare as far as building codes? You know accessibility and all, all that stuff in today's standards. It's good. All right, good. It's good. All yes. right. And we've con and, uh, there's also another building inspector, 
Uh, all right. Uh, Sorry, Doug. We've consulted with Neil all the way along on this, so okay. he's good. We're not going to take step one without consultants. His yes. town. Last year. Colin is going to uh, present the community input process that we went through and the potential reuse options and recommendations from this committee. And I'll be somewhat brief on this, uh, so that we can go through and some questions. Uh, but I want to just run through briefly the input process and then the scenarios that came out of that. Uh, I think Tim said it well. We took on an exhausting community input mm -hmm. process that we had no idea was going to be such when we decided to just have, have a little survey. Um, but that's exactly what we did. Um, when this first, when this idea came to us, and the basic idea was, what do you do here? It was uh, relatively easy to look at codes and regulations and get some answers on what you can and can't. It was a little harder to say, okay, so what, what should we do? So we decided to ask the community and the town and did two different surveys, one to the town uh, government, essentially, town boards, commissions, uh, departments, as to what uh, their needs are and what they thought might be useful uh, in this particular location, and the other to the community overall, a uh, resident survey that we, we did online uh, with the express intent to reach the largest number of people that we could. Uh, and we did. Uh, with the government survey, we got our responses back from our departments and from our boards and commissions. We found basically that you know, there's a general need for space, uh, particularly storage and particularly meeting spaces. Uh, I don't know if that was particularly shocking in that survey, but that's what we found uh, from the administrative side. There are some concerns or issues uh, to deal with in addressing those needs because of the use restrictions on the site. Uh, could be used for meetings, but we can't have town offices there. Uh, we can have general storage and town equipment there, but there, there are some ancillary things that could be used from uh, the rec departments uh, and programming and whatnot. On the community side, we <coughs> received over a thousand responses uh, to our survey. Uh, and what was most fun <coughs> were the 500 comments <laughs> that came with the multiple choice questions. Uh, and digesting all of those responses uh, and the standard questions, what, what do you think should happen here? What's your highest priorities? What would you support most and least? Uh, distilling all of that, we found that uh, by far the highest priority use was park space, uh, followed by mar maritime uses. And we'll discuss a little bit of what those mean. And then youth programs and senior programs. Uh, and as you dove into the comments that we got, and we got over 500 comments, uh, you can fill in any other and give us some additional information on what that meant. Park space didn't mean ball fields. It didn't mean you know active recreation. It tended to mean uh, passive open space, uh, taking advantage of the harbor, getting access to the waterfront. Uh, a lot of situations developed uh, along the waterfront. You can't just get anywhere, despite the fact that we're on the ocean. Uh, so we saw a lot of comments about you know providing that kind of use at this location. Uh, maritime uses were expressly not marinas. Uh, there were a lot of comments about uh, with a distinct lack of interest in a marina, but mm -hmm. a significant interest in, again, the views, access, uh, maybe you know, a launch, uh, being able to put a kayak in or uh, a sailing program could run out of there, but not necessarily you know, another commercial uh, marina used to be uh, located in that sense. And then with the youth programs and senior programs, they came together really in this concept of a community center. Um, we heard a lot of input about the senior center. We heard a lot of input about uh, a youth center. Um, and the, the survey responses kind of proved that out. And in addition to some of the direct responses, there were several themes that started to come out uh, from the comments that we saw. Some of those were making this site open to the greatest number of people in the community and making, making it uh, cost neutral. Uh, we did see a lot, and Ed will talk about a little bit, uh, the idea of revenue generation, and that conflicts a little, to a certain extent with the use limitations, but to the extent that we can generate revenue, people afford it, but they would at least would like to see something that's cost neutral or not, you know, tremendous burden. Um, we saw, again, as a theme, water views and access to the harbor, and then what came out of it was the lack of uh, interest in, in marinas themselves. So we took all of these responses and distilled them into some concepts uh, that we could present to the community, and that's what we developed uh, for the community forum that we held last year on April 30th, uh, where we presented uh, some conceptual plans of what we thought uh, the survey and our research into codes and 
options uh, presented for uh, potential <coughs> uses at this site. So, uh, the first one was park space, and that's, that's what this board over here is depicting. Uh, these are illustrative concepts. Uh, these are basically just shown, uh, designed and developed just to basically put a visual to the idea and so that we could illustrate uh, to the community what uh, the concepts were. And some of the themes on this particular uh, plan were to, one, include some parking. Uh, this is approximately 50 spaces, which was modeled on the, of the lighthouse site, uh, having something similar, uh, which is an active site uh, we can go down to putting the green space actually on the waterfront itself as opposed to the street. And the idea that you could have a pier or some sort of extension into the water that could either be for fishing or uh, boat access or kayaks or the like. Uh, again, these are general concepts, but that's that's the general idea with this type of scenario. Um, the park space concept comes with certain trade-offs. This depicts no building. Uh, somewhat intentionally because when you look at, and we did look at the idea of Park Space Plus, uh, the existing building and how might you combine the two, the parking requirements for making use of the building start to basically become so much that you have very little park space left. So the concept of the park uh, gets a little bit lost. So when we talk about the concept of park space and open space on the sites, it tends to, uh, to become meaningful, tends to be in raising the building and uh, developing something conceptually along these lines. The second alternative uh, that came up uh, is maritime uses, uh, which tend to uh, it can be integrated into a lot of things, but that's what the pier comes in, uh, and where, again, some park space could be integrated. That may be a type of alternative use that could be integrated with the concept of an existing building or uh, raising the building altogether and using the uh, park. So, Colin, oh, no, just, just one one point. So you, you just show this this green here, and and I I know the answer to this, but I want to make sure people out there do. But you also mentioned this context, like part of it could be a playground on one side, and you mentioned some historical things as well. So your vision at this point for park space wouldn't just be flat grass. No, the idea for part in, if I can impose my own personal view, <laughs> uh, and, and we did include it in the report in the report here. The idea for park space isn't so much that it wouldn't be active. You wouldn't have ball fields, tennis courts, right. not, but you would have. Um, more of a passive space, uh, benches, walkways, plantings, uh, landscape right. sites, not just a lawn. Um, you just answered the question. So it just looks like a sea of right. grass, but Don't there's know. other stuff there. Grab Thank a hot dog, come over there, sit down, and right. walk. Right. Well, that's, yeah, right. and we right. can talk about uh, this, yeah, this, Go buy a this, sign, this, carry the sign down. Yeah. These, the the, the drawings are potentially something down. Like that. Uh, the okay. most Thanks. active, the one I didn't want to point out, though, in terms of something that starts approaching something that's more active, is the idea of the frog pond. Uh, yep. That would be a dual concept for uh, summer and then skating rink in the winter. Uh, the idea uh, being there that becomes a little bit more active and then actually may be the opportunity to make the site destination that could draw people in to right. support the downtown. Gotcha. Right. Thanks. Uh, that's the what you mentioned. Right. right. You could do a large right. space that is yeah. not revenue generated by itself, but could right. be else. You know, sure. Ancillary. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, so, maritime use. Uh, somewhat self-explanatory, but in terms of plans, um, it's not necessarily illustrated except for the fact that there could be a fear, there could be access and boat ramps and whatnot. Um, the other alternative for the sites and the concept of um, developing and supporting the youth programs and senior programs uh, <coughs> resulted in the idea of this multi-generational uh, community center. Um, as the themes from the survey goes out, the idea was open up this way to most is. We'd like yeah. to see a uh, facility that was dedicated to one particular age group in town and one particular uh, population in town. And so we looked at uh, two variations of that theme, and that's what these two boards uh, helped illustrate uh, a little bit. So this is the existing site plan today. This is what's there now. Uh, the idea being that you could reuse the building. Uh, as we went through this process, we looked at uh, we looked at Duxbury, uh, we looked at Norwell. One of the things that we had were the development plans um, for the proposed uh, senior center in town in 2005. And we went through a process of overlaying some of those footprints on this site. Uh, and you can, in fact, fit some of those programmatic elements into this building. Uh, what exactly those might be are phase two. And that 
base plan that we use as a reference was a senior center, not a multi-generational center. So there are some programmatical differences uh, that would come into play as you, if you would pursue it. But that building would roughly give you two-thirds of uh, the size of the senior center that was propo proposed in 2005, uh, as it is. The issues that come up with the existing building are some of the code requirements you, you might trigger, depending on the investments uh, and how far you go with renovating the existing building, you might trigger certain thresholds. There's a 50% threshold for the value of the building that may in fact mean we have to make go two steps further, raise it, and we go from spending X to X times four. Um, and in that type of scenario, if we were to trigger that, it's, it may be a different uh, ball game. We might actually uh, want to do something else entirely. And for that reason, we looked at the concept uh, on the left here, which is a new building. And the idea here is that on um, the southern portion of the site, the pink uh, square there, that is the upland portion of the site. That is the one part of uh, this, this parcel that is outside of the velocity zone and the flood zones that could be developed with a new structure and the remaining sites uh, being used for parking. Uh, this is laid out, the reason it's blocked is it's purely conceptual. Uh, the approximate 4,800 4, square foot footprint is basically the maximum you can fit within that area. And uh, the idea being that you could go up, you can go up two or three stories within that particular zone now and be somewhat consistent with the surrounding areas. If you were to do that, you'd have a building you know, roughly 10,000 square feet, which is approximately the size of the senior center that was proposed in 05. Um, Duxbury is about 13,000 square feet, I think Longwell's around 10. Um, so just to give you a sense of what that meant. And then the parking spaces, uh, we estimate you could fit about 80 spaces uh, there. Today there are 70. Uh, that parking would dictate how big the building could be. Uh, and the designs for what parking actually lays out to be might get more efficient. Uh, so that, that's all phase two type work. And again, you, you can try to incorporate as much as you could on the waterfront for green space and harbor use. Uh, but that, that concept is uh, certainly the most expensive. Uh, that's what we tried to indicate in the report. We don't know exactly how much because that's a phase two uh, issue. Uh, that's where you get into programming uh, and design issues. And we start really cutting down into what makes the most sense. Um, would we trigger a threshold here that makes more sense to go here? Or should we go with uh, an entirely different option altogether with park space and open space? Uh, that would probably be the least expensive. Those are the three uh, scenarios. There's uh, frankly two within the multi-generational, so uh, this uh, an argument that there's four uh, uh, that we've come up with. Uh, and this is, again, as I said, a phase one uh, step, stage right now. There's a lot more that would need to be done in terms of programmatic review, design elements, and cost amounts. Uh, but you know, we can address any questions once that's finished. I have one quick question. Are you guys, um, in all your review of regulations or anything like that, how much sewer space is allocated to that, to the current site and location? Like how much capacity of sewer? So if... So many seats. Al, so many Al, seats. Al, you'd know that off the top of your head, wouldn't you? Yeah, uh, about 20 pounds. No. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, what is used as a, as a restaurant was uh, much greater than any yeah. subsequent uses would ever, ever be. Right, but is that, is that equivalent to 10 houses getting 10 private residents getting hooked up on sewer? Or one? The, the, the or The certificate 30. of occupancy from, from, from Neil was 300 people. And usually when whatever determines the occupant load is the, the most restrictive factor, be it egress or presumably you know capacity like that so 300 people would probably be the maximum number and so that is that the equivalent i know nothing about this gentleman I, is that people, two homes well or is that sewage is, 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 is yeah. like that number of bedrooms okay so you can have a four bedroom house with four people or a four bedroom house with 12 people but you so that could be people. like you know, it's, it's, so that it's, could be like 30 or 40 homes it's not comparable yeah that could be like 30 or 40 homes ballpark just making it up. Not, not necessarily. There's a function halls have altogether different uh, requirements than restaurants, for instance. Uh, gymnasiums with showers have different uh, Title V requirements than 
would be um, a, a retail <coughs> business, for instance, or a, or a uh, park. Yep. So, so let's not throw I don't want to quite a yeah. calculation. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone okay. in the press that typed 30 or 40 homes? <laughs> That's <laughs> fictional. <laughs> so some, some number of some homes. Some number of homes, but it's not one. Donna. That's cool. What was proposed for the previous nine story? Is that in the sewer zone? Yes, it's tied into town sewer. <clears throat> the only one thing before we go into the questions is you mentioned briefly the revenue generation. Yes, sir. <coughs> is that what you're going to touch on? Yeah, okay. I'm going to talk about that next. Um, the, uh, the subject of revenue generation, we did speak briefly about during phase one. It was a subject that was very important to the public through the feedback we got through the surveys. And we did some uh, research into what would possibly be allowed in one of the given building design scenarios or even a park scenario that could generate revenue because of the use restrictions that are imposed on the site and the primary uses that are imposed on the site. And um, it's worth mentioning that the, uh, the public would, would really like to see the use of the site generate revenue to offset operations and maintenance costs. Um, it'd be nice to have a net zero uh, facility. <laughs> The, um, now, to, to generate revenue based on the town council's opinion is that we could generate revenue if it supports the primary use. And to give you an example, um, say if the um, community center, if we've had a new com community center on the property, that would be the primary use of the property. The accessory use could be a snack bar or a sandwich shop in the building that could generate revenue to help offset the operation of maintenance costs. Another example could be if you had a, a town pier there and the town wanted to offer kayaking rentals. Um, you, could, you could do that because that would be an accessory use to say the primary use of a park. So there are ways of working in revenue generating ideas, but they're not big uh, businesses. They're, they're accessory uses to the primary purpose. Um, it also has to be something that falls in with normal municipal fees, fee rates. Um, it, it can't be. It can't be something that's um, more in the, the uh, private sector rates. It's got to be something that the, the community would usually charge the citizens. Um, and each, basically, the charges have to cover the costs that the town would be incurring for offering the services and, and making a, uh, some amount of profit to cover operations and maintenance. But that's definitely something that we will be pursuing in more detail in phase two. Uh, phase two is going to include not only the revenue generation, but project finance. And that's a big part of phase two is to develop the ideas, whatever ideas you'd like us to look at. As I mentioned earlier, and Colin alluded to, is that we're going to get into the nuts and bolts next in phase two. Uh, whichever one or all three that you'd like us to uh, further develop. That's when we get into schematic designs. That's where we start doing programming and planning, uh, do uh, site plans, floor plans, building elevations if that's the case, hard cost estimating, uh, figuring out the financing, um, how, how is it best to finance a given project, uh, how to present that to town meeting. So we'll be looking at all the, uh, the nuts and bolts of the project during, during phase two. Um, the, the, the next steps, just to wrap up and, and to close, is the, uh, as your board completes the review and provides us with the information to move forward, um, we'll, the next step would be moving straight into phase two, which we'll call the schematic design phase of the project. Um, I just want to close with, with saying that it's, it's been a pleasure for this committee to work on this project. Um, we've worked on it long and hard. The committee put 17 months of very hard effort a lot of meetings, a lot of, a lot of hard work by the committee members, and we, we enjoyed, enjoyed the time working on this, and it is an important project for all of us. So we uh, thank you for entrusting us with this project, and we're looking forward to phase two of the project. Thank you. Thank you. And you, all of you did a great job summarizing this. You hit all the major points. There's a whole lot more in this detailed report. Is this on, is this on the website? Yes, the right? I think it is, right? If it's not, it will Did be. Did you send it? Uh, it went up the day you sent <coughs> it. It should be. It's up there. Yeah, we, we sent it to the webmaster. Yeah. Yep. Great job. Great job. For those of you that take a look at it, you'll see just really how thorough it is and how much hard work went into it. So thank you. Um, why don't we just run down, you know, 
push some questions back and forth. I mean, you did a great job telling us the details, so I don't know how much people have, but uh, um, John, you want to start? Or sure. Well, I have. Take a couple. I have a lot of thoughts about it, which I have to work on. I, I want to say thank you to all. I mean, to be able to go through this project and take a look at the site and begin to say, okay, what can we do? What are the options? Um, and now you've put it back into us into a decision, which it's a lot easier to criticize or critique and try to say what <laughs> somebody has a project, what you can do with it, but it's another to be able to come up and say, this is what I think we as a town should do, which is now our duty to, um, to determine going through and spending the time and you know we, we put this together hoping that we could get a dis you know the, the committee together and make a decision but I think you know it's taken an awful lot of effort to go through this thoroughly and so you know we are as a town doing our due diligence you've you demonstrated that the past year and a half I commend you all it's it's fabulous to have read this and now say okay what's the next step in this process um, I, I when I looked at this you got me to think <coughs> about some other thoughts and I'm thinking you know maybe going forward we can look at it I don't know whatever the board wants to do but um, I like the concept that you had here with the um, possibility of um, opening up the site and, and and adding another building or a new building and then that got me to think you know with the prospects of a pier under chapter 91 and the hurdles of having to do it is the possibility of actually taking that building and pushing it back onto pilings of some sort so you get more space, whether it's parking or green space, to some degree. Um, so that was one of the thoughts I had in looking at it. Um, the other was overflow parking. I know that we as a town have the um, parking lot on the other side of the abutter, and I don't know whether or not we can tack on, if you will, with our uses, if we have multiple uses to do it. I also know that it's a state um, pier, so I don't know if that infringes on it. And then I'm thinking, well, do we as a town have other options around the surrounding area with lots that maybe we can take a look at? So those are the kind of like my first thoughts looking at it is about more opportunities. Um, Doug. I, I, I can answer the, the, your first question. It's a slab on grade building and there's no floor. Oh, oh I'm not talking about the building. Sorry, oh, sorry. I'm talking about the building. Yeah, I know, AZE -E as opposed to AISE. I mean, we, we, we looked at well, raising it like up on pilings, but. I'm saying. Don't even look at this plan. Look okay. at this plan here. You said raise the new building. Tear it down. That's okay. what I'm saying. Right. Raise it. Put the building right. 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 What about if you push it back and putting it on pilings to some extent? Right. Right. So you get yeah. more green space potentially, maybe parking or. Yeah. You, we, you, could never live, you could never live. Oh, that's that. gone if that's the option. You could never live with that. No. Okay. Any event. But thank you very right. much. I, I appreciate it. Raise. Sorry. Sorry. Any other? Uh, again, just uh, to repeat to thank you and how difficult this is to as you go through the solicitor's your presentation, uh, one of the strongest suggestions by the community was to, to keep it open space. But they also want a revenue stream. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, that's a compute. They can't do it. Really. All you can, and I think when they talk about a revenue source, I don't think they're talking about five hundred dollars a week. You know, I think they're talking about a revenue source. And I'm not sure that's possible uh, to do. With certain, with some of our options, some would probably wouldn't be. But. So I think that's what I'm saying is that it's all be balanced out. And try to figure out exactly what people want and exactly what we want. But thank you. Just a quick comment, if I could, Tony, um, <clears throat> to piggyback on what everyone has said. What a great job you guys have done is almost like an understatement. With the restrictions that you have had placed on it, I can only imagine if that was a private parcel. <laughs> and you could do anything with it. This would have gone from 43 to 400 pages. Yeah. I mean, you guys, if I had something to develop, I'd have you guys do it for me. Well, we had to read two of those proposals, prior proposals. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, um, just thank you very, very much. I, you know, appreciate right. it. All the work. Yeah, great job. Read the whole thing. This is awesome. Um, just as a comment, you know, raise and raise is the only word, two words in the English language that sound the same that mean exactly the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Truly, the only words in the whole language. So here we are. Here we are. Here we are using them all day long. Um, Say tear down. Yeah, exactly right. But uh, regarding some of the stuff, and this is you know directed to all of you, but perhaps Stan, um, given his expertise. But with the um, uh, pier, um, we'd be allowed to put in a couple pilings out there. I, I know that when people were talking earlier about marina options. Things. I know from my waterways experience and so on, it's not really a good spot to put in marina stuff anyways. It also gets a lot of water there. You've got 
one marina over there, you got the other marina over there. There's really not a lot of room for that. But I was wondering if regarding the pier, the viewing pier you have out there, would it enable a, um, and I know what you had just concept plan, but a couple pilings, and then you could have the platform out there where people could fish and a little gazebo or whatever, you know, sort of deal. Could you put a down ramp to like a floating dock component of it so people could launch kayaks? Uh, Colin, you said a kayak rental in terms of revenue and in, in terms of access. Is that, <coughs> I'm not going to hold, hold you to it, but you know far more about it than anybody else in this room. It, it all has to do with water dependent instead of non water dependent uses. Yeah. <clears throat> so it even goes to the maybe pushing a building out there. Yeah. On a pile supported structure. Um, a float is fine. Yeah. We've got a lot of area that's, that's um, exposed during low tide. Yeah. The issue of dredging came up. And I think that's a death knell. Yeah, no. <laughs> right, right, right away. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that. But backing up, I'm sure, pile supported structures. Um, there's no eelgrass bed, there's no uh, submerged aquatic vegetation right. that would in, be impacted by shading. Right. So I think the dimensions of the platform are pretty open yeah. for discussion. And if that's something you want us to further explore in phase two, I'd probably suggest talking to some of the regulators. Yeah. Not only local, but the state and federal yeah, right, levels. Right, right. Sure. Yeah. Okay, that's great. That's it for me right now. Um, truly, this is lots of stuff. I got ink all over the thing. This is great. Thank you so much. Thank you. A couple, a couple questions. Um, or things that stuck out to me. The, the first thing that came to mind, and obviously there's four kind of proposals here. There's the open space, there's the marine aspect, there's the use of the existing building and the building of a new building. You know, kind of right. one open space and one building occupied space. You know, the, the thing that, that came to me is, you know, we've come, you've come to us and said the building's structurally and systematically in very good shape. And that's part of the asset that we bought for two million bucks. You know, it just seems to me that I wouldn't initially go knock it over, um, you know, if there's some sort of use for it. So that was one thing that came to me. There's use in towns or needs in towns for that sort of stuff, and it is a good building. So um, one thought that I had, um, you know, obviously there's a restriction if you're going to do a lot of repair work, but there's money to do repair still in the NGDA funds, but you can't do more than $800,000 worth of it, or you've got to raise the building and you've got to do all sorts of requirement stuff. But you know, if you put eighteen eight hundred thousand dollars into that building, you could probably make it look pretty nice. Um, the other thing that I couldn't understand that maybe someone can explain to me is I don't know, I guess all the pictures are the same, but what how do we only have water rights for that one little section right there? How, how is it that we don't have from this end of the property to that end of the property the rights to the water? Because it's owned by somebody else. Yeah. So what the physical the physical property lines that's the, property, about. the property lines about this far from the face of the building. Yeah. Three, so somebody feet. else's property line over here goes around. They own the revetment. Yeah. Owns the lawn. The yeah. the marina that is located here, mm -hmm. its property line runs up and then across, and that is their property. Uh, all the property lines end at the low water mark, right. and beyond that is the public water. So initially, though, when somebody stamps out pieces of property on the water. Do you get it from your borders to the low water mark? Did the town sell those water rights to somebody at some point in time? Anyone know? Typically ownership in Massachusetts is privately down to mean low water. But there are reserved public rights between mean low water and mean high water. Um, there are, and I have understood, a number of parcels in situate that actually extend below mean low water into Commonwealth Tidelands, but because it was privately conveyed, it's, it is that way. Right, but why don't we have, why is it, why why is it an, oh yeah. Somebody sold the Somebody right. did Somebody it a hundred years and ago. Said, yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah. Wasn't it owned all by the O'Neills years ago? My father would know. Yeah, long time ago. Right. The Dwai yes. is Well, the Russo's and all, all kinds of people. So. I Alan think, it was, I think it. to answer Tony's question, mm -hmm. I think it was all owned at one pass. Right. Yeah. So somebody Alan Wheeler somebody owned cut it, it up. Time way back when. I so know we own the property next door. They tried to privatize yeah, it. The state said no. The town said no. Right. Oh. So along those lines, though, then, to follow up on Tony's question, 
I hadn't actually thought of this. So who's responsible for fixing the revetment, for example, that's right in front of the current building? Yes. Not us. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. So in terms of an asset. We have about this far. You go with the Tony's. building and then yeah, the revetment yeah. Okay, so if, if I understand, so Tony's idea would be that, so if that revetment starts to fail and threaten the town asset, the other person who owns that is responsible for that revetment. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they, they title search on the yeah, property they, ownership. Okay. Yeah. God, you guys have one of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the other committee. The other thing that's great. You know, in terms of the building, <laughs> at one point we thought we could go up, you know, take the existing building, put a second or third floor on it, but that's really limited in terms of there's no elevator and the disability requirements that you'd need to get. It would be expensive. Yeah, the expense is limited enough. Um, it push over the 800. You need to go down four feet for the pit, and then and you're, in, and you're in the water. At that right. Point. Um, the other thing that I found interesting was when I, I took your graphs and I added the first, who put the three things that were, or all four things actually, who marked like park space as either one, two, or three on their list? And 53% of the people said park was one of their top three choices. And then for young child stuff, 48% put it as one, two, or three. And youth stuff, 43% put it as one, two, or three. And community stuff, 43% put it as one, two, or three. So there's really no clear indication from any source what to do with this project. Um, there's 50-ish percent, and that's just me eyeing your charts here, you know, 45 to 55% of the people like all those ideas to some extent. So, uh, what's the specific page you know, Just these graphs that they put on 25. Right. So, so it wasn't like you took this outreach to the people and you did it in surveys, you did it in all kinds of communications and websites, and still there's no clear indication of what people want to do with this piece of land. I don't, and did you guys read that any differently than me? I mean, no, you feel like a pinball at times. Yeah. Let's and make money. No, we can't. Let's do open space. Let's do. No. So I, I, I thought that was, you know, you're not coming to us with clearly 97% of the people in the town want to make it a community center, so go ahead and do it. So it's it's really a mixed bag of what people think the use of the property should be, is the way I'm. One thing about the survey that I have people said to me. We were trying to reach the largest amount as effectively as we could. But for seniors who don't have a computer, and it was on the internet, they felt that their voice wasn't heard because we, we just wasn't good. Cool. You know, we didn't have the money to send out students to stamp the whole thing. But that's an element that's strong. We just felt they weren't heard on the internet. And that was shown when you had your meeting, and 15 of the people that spoke, 14 of them were saying they wanted a senior center because that was a forum when they could get right. Right. get but to it. Right. Right. Willow Park, there was one person that had a computer, and that's a senior community. Yeah. Only one had a computer. Right. So people would say that were in favor of, well, let them go to the library. But they don't have any education, and even if they went to the library, they wouldn't try to use it. Right. That's a good point. So that's even another one that probably if they had access to all the polling devices would have been yeah. right up there with the 40 and 50 percent of the other uses. Yes. Um, so I, I, I think I think if we were hoping for you guys to come back to us and yeah. say, yeah. Hmm, clearly knock the building over and let's put a, a water slide there as Joe's been trying to do for a <laughs> <laughs> um, that that's not the case. That we still have we still have a lot of work before us in terms of figuring out what the use is. And on the flip side, it's a good problem because whatever we choose out of those options is probably not a bad choice because a good chunk of the people feel the same way. That's what I got out of the... You know, the, the these are the top choices that... Right. I did, to speak to the point of you know, what do we have support for and, and the greatest number. And I don't have the parentheticals here, and there's, you know, the raw data is confusing to get through. Right, you sent us all those matrices. And right, we're, we're and there are, there is data that supports um, a percentage of the population, or the 
Senator for respondents to the survey that chose or that strongly support park space. Right. Uh, and that's also coupled with one of the other questions as to the rankings of where would you rank your priority uses for the site, which also came out to park, it actually mirrored uh, for the support that came out park space, um, maritime uses, youth programs, senior programs. That was also mirrored in the rankings that came out Park Space, Maritime right. uh, Senior Programs. Yeah, Park Space did get the number, and the largest amount of first, number one choices. Yes, and what what was most telling, what was actually difficult about the survey process overall was the volume of comments that came in. Mm -hmm. uh, and Gabrielle's not here, she did most of the work for vetting them, you know, for categorizing the, those comments. We had over 500 you know, comments that came in trying to figure out you know, what they meant as, you a, been a, those? as a group. Uh, it was challenging, but it was overwhelmingly uh, through the comment process uh, an indication that park space uh, in the passive sense was a supported use uh, and as was the multi-generational type of uh, center. That's why we, when we looked at creating these types of concepts, we took the survey and we didn't say necessarily, you know, we got the most number of people saying, you know, make the building this. Uh, we, we distilled it into the um, reuse of the building, the you know, reuse of the site, and the support that came through with open spaces and maritime uses and programmatic uh, things, but probably more so with the themes that came through with make it accessible to the broadest sector of the population. Right. You know, don't, don't say it's for this group and only that group, and right. don't, don't make mm -hmm. it just this, but make it most useful for the greatest number of residents uh, in situ. Um, preserve the, and make use of the unique characteristics of the site, which is the fact that it, it's on the harbor. That's why we didn't see a lot of people wanting um, active recreation. We have ball fields, we've got tennis courts, we've got soccer fields somewhere else. And you can do that somewhere else in town. Uh, there's a sentence in here that says, and it was one of the survey questions that um, came back as, the needs are not met elsewhere in the community. And some of the initial comments we got back when we were looking at that, it was a little confusing. What do you mean? You don't have this somewhere in situ. And the point was that you don't have a site on the harbor with this type of uh, amenity uh, in situ. You know, we, we don't have the opportunity to do something on the waterfront like we have here. And those types of unique characteristics were really what were driving some of these things. And park space or open space or whatever you know, manifests uh, lends itself nicely to that. Uh, as does the possibility of some of the programmatic aspects in maybe a, the existing building or anything. They do, they do conflict in the sense that you need parking for the one, and that just eats up a lot of land. Right. Well, I think Cole Parkway is another area in town where you kind of have right. some of those some of those opportunities, but. Um, you know, we'll go through the process. We'll talk about it and figure out the next step. I mean, at some point, we're going to say building or no building, and then that'll lead you to, you know, the next tier of what decision making will be. But um, any other comments from anybody in closing? No, nope. thank you. Great. Just thank you again. Uh, thank if you. you have any other thoughts, email us. Um, you know, once we get through town meeting next week, we will, uh, you know, get back to this, digest it, and, and get you on the, the task of phase two as quickly as possible. Just one procedural thing. Do we have to move to accept this report, to formally accept the report? That's what we've done in the past on things. So it closes formally this component. Why don't we do that? Uh, so I'll move to accept the uh, Pier 44 options and feasibility study phase one report to the Board of Selectmen. Second. Second by Mr. Danny. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you for your time and dedication. Thanks, Sam. Nice job. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Pat, thank you. Very nice. Good job. Okay. So we'll move on to item number nine, which is a discussion vote. And then that was sort of. The survey was not.
We didn't present the options. Okay. Okay. Of the, uh, options came out of of the uh, Harbor Community Building, 44 Jericho Road, and the uh, building rentals. So, um, this discussion we've had over the past, um, well, at least a month or so, in terms of what what we want the use of that building to be, because we're getting just numerous requests for people to use it. And as I mentioned earlier in the evening, it's really inadequate in a, in a couple of areas in terms of being able to handle a lot of people. There's no kitchen, the bathrooms are limited, um, and we really haven't put any investment into that until we find out what we're gonna do with the facility. So I think what Kim and Trisha are looking for is some direction in terms of what we should and should not allow at that facility. Is that? Yeah, if I, if I could just, um, one of the things I think that was really important um, that we heard from folks after town meeting um, two years ago was that it would just be another town building falling down and, you know, be mothballed. Um, the building was a complete and utter mess when we acquired it. It took six months to um, take out what was in it, identify if any of it was salvageable because we became public owners of it. Anything that had a value of $25 needed to be bid out or offered for sale if the town didn't have a use for it. Um, so there was extensive work involved in doing that. In addition, as was mentioned um, by the committee, um, they went through the building and told us what, you know, needed to be done in terms of code and safety issues. So um, Al and his crew did yeoman's work in spending, again, a considerable amount of time just to make the building safe, more presentable. We spent about $60,000 to do that. Um, and, and when we were able to just get the building functional, not pretty, not, I mean, clearly lipstick on a pig is what was used. Um, I'm sitting right here. We, um, as was noticed, also noted, um, we have a tremendous need for s meeting space. So we opened it up immediately for meeting space for town boards and committees. Um, and then offered a, a nominal rental option to folks if they wanted to use it. Um, that has been enormously successful. We had to double the fee from 100 to 200 dollars in January because there is no budgetary appropriation. Um, we really shouldn't be using what's left of the MBTA mitigation fund to pay for a cleaning service or whatever. Um, but what's happened is the building has become enormously popular. And it's really, as you mentioned, not in the best of condition. Um, We've had about 15 private paying rentals, I think. There's a schedule that you have. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the carpet is, you know, really not in the best shape. The bathrooms, there's two sets of bathrooms. We reprogrammed the HP bathroom, so that's available, um, but sometimes temperamental. So the concern is when we give this building to allow somebody to rent it and the toilet goes, as there was a problem with one event, you know, who's responsible for fixing that? The, the building's fully alarmed, um, but somebody needs to be responsible to uh, respond to that fire alarm when it's tripped. Um, and it's been pretty um, cantankerous sometimes. So, I think that's so yeah. what we anticipated was let's get the building open, let, you know, residents see that, you know, it's a functional building that we just paid 1.8 million for. Um, it's sort of gone to, you know, this other need with liquor or entertainment or stuff that we really didn't anticipate. Um, and so that's really what we wanted to talk to you. So I've stopped making any, taking any reservations after June 30th, waiting to see these folks come in here today. But if we're really going to continue to rent that building and charge people, we need to program it for budgetary purposes in our budget, which we don't have, um, and also maybe put some more investment into it. I mean, it really could use a new rug. The second bathroom set should probably be programmed. Um, but, but there are some bigger areas there in terms of managing it. Paula um, in the DPW office uh, agreed to schedule it for meetings, um, but we also get many, many requests for nonprofits in town that we have to um, decline because we don't have the ability to maintain that building right now. 
So um, given that Pier 44 came in tonight, we thought it would be a good opportunity to get guidance from the board on next steps as far as certain types of requests that we're getting in, um, you know, what happens after July 1, but also really needing to uh, have some in-house capacity that we don't have right now to address the needs of a building that we've now taken on in addition to the other buildings that were stretched thin to, to oversee. Good. Comments? Sean? Go first, Joe. No, just, just <coughs> thinking aloud like I think we're going to be doing on this subject. Uh, is there any sense, I mean, is there any sense in, in renting at all going forward if in turn it's going to be a pack a year from now and we want to rent it for 10 months until it changes into something else or we want to cut the cord now and say no more? I guess that's my question that's going through my mind. Uh, and if we, if, we, if we decide to continue the way we're going, uh, letting groups use it, we're going to get the money. Again, I agree with you that I don't think we should be taking from the mitigation fund to, to, to back in the rugs. So. Right, and we talked about charging even more for rent, but, you know, town board or committee meeting is different from having somebody have a wedding function there or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we really, I have a concern, and I know Al does too, about someone's paying us a fee to rent this building and the heating doesn't work or the air conditioning dies in the middle of July 15th and the windows don't open. Those are the kinds of concerns that we band-aided it to open it to get it into public use, which I think was a good decision. It's this private rental use that's sort of gotten out of our control. Right. So we just heard if we don't clump, if we don't clump too much, four potential options for this building down the road, and you just laid them out. Three of them don't involve this building, you know, to Joe's point. So I'm just throwing that out there as a point that I'm working through, which I didn't really understand until you had said that earlier, Tony. Sean? To Tony's point, though, <coughs> and to continue on with you, Rick, if um, the committee had come to us tonight and told us that, you know, it's rotted, it's ready to fall down, we, we have to tear it down, then that would influence my decision yeah, I kind of like, didn't say that no no yeah. just yeah, you know, much like the gate school it's you know it, it, yeah. it's maybe a, not quite as good a shape but if um, I'd like to see it remain the way it's going couldn't agree more with Tricia although I think the, the journey the janitor and the um, person checking on the alarm could stay right in place you know he's doing a good job now <laughs> yeah, retiring in June. <laughs> no um, Increase the increase the, the fee to to yeah. offset that. Is there some way we could, you know, if it's meeting space, that that's one thing. But as we just granted it for a, a private party, you restrict you know, the size. I don't know about restricting the size, but maybe you know, make it fair. Make it fair so we can have a service master come in to clean it and and maybe all of those things. You know, to keep, make make sure the HVAC is going to function properly I mean things can happen it's you know it's an older building but you know in the past couple of weeks you know someone had approached me about a, um, a class reunion and and someone had made some comments might have been Kim or Tricia that it's not that nice of a building but you know someone who grew up in this town there's a lot of memories I've been to weddings and dinners and all of us have been probably when it was open and uh, that's the reason they want to have it there if they wanted the Taj Mahal that go to Boston and rent out some building in Boston you know the fact that it's um, you know was there and, and, and they used to go there that's part of the reason they may want to choose that location but so it, it's again it's it's more work for Trisha and Al and, and Paula as well but maybe to come up with an idea to continue down this path but certainly raise revenues enough to have the building professionally maintained I guess to to continue down this path and then when they come with phase two that will cross that bridge but but in the in the interim we we vote on a case-by-case -case basis possibly you know uh, there's a lot more I probably have more questions than I have answers but that's just the way I'm feeling 
Sure. I, um, I'm kind of looking at it from three different phases, so um, or three different angles. One is that kind of like prioritizing it uh, for access to it. I think first and foremost, anything dealing with town use should be the primary use. When I say town, I mean looking from the town perspective, um, uh, and I'm not talking private perspective. So if the Council on Aging needed to be able to use it for some of the programs, I think we should be using that immediately because they, they are out of space for it on a temporary, stand, uh, on a temporary basis. Um, you know, if you want to have meetings down there, I think that's another thing. The question I have for you, uh, Tricia, would be then, obviously, if, if the town is going to be using it, um, is there a way of getting the, um, um, seeing that the, the, the person who's presently cleaning it and checking on the fire is going to probably not going to be here after June 1st or, or July 1st. Can we get somebody from this area or from here or from Council on Aging, whoever takes care to go down to take a look once or twice a week? At, uh, Pier well, 40 there's several clean issues. Up. I mean, the building needs not a full-time caretaker or even a part-time caretaker, but um, the bookings and everything need someone to handle. It's just like the Maritime Center and the GAR Hall. Um, you know, everything's on the website, but the private rentals and arranging that and finding out who's going to be there and getting the certificate of insurance that's turned into quite a bit. We'll still make it available for boards and committees, but we're getting requests for August, September, November now, and that's really what the challenge so is. That gets me, the first angle I was saying is, okay, looking at it from the town to make sure that the town continues to use it on a temporary right. basis until this board makes a decision. When the board makes a decision, that's gonna be presumably shortly. We know from the past year and a half, it's taken phase one these people to come up with phase one so I'm not anticipating anything happening to that structure for at least another two years and it may even take a little longer if, if, if so I'm looking at this for a temporary for the next two years this the, the the next aspect I'm looking at is the revenue and saying you know can we we got to figure out what is a fair price to charge people if they're gonna come in and rent the place then we can't just charge them a nominal two hundred dollars it's that plus a, a cleaning fee we have to figure out maybe you know, the uh, professional cleaner will <coughs> go in and clean up after them. And I think you have to factor that in right, if you're going to rent it. Right, there is a cleaning it. deposit now, another $100. But, uh, but I'm saying, like, literally, here's the cost of hiring Joe Schmo cleaners who are going to go in after you've done to clean up after you. That's a $300 cost on top of the 200 cost. And there's a $100 deposit or for damage deposit, if that's what you're talking about. So I think you have to factor that in for rentals. I think the bigger issue is the... Um, is the position because you know for town maybe you can coordinate it but you really need one person like like the maritime center and so i don't know whether you, you take that out of a, a small position it would be short term i don't know that i don't have an answer to but i think the other suggestions are that you know town first somebody from town cleaning up after town using it but then um, you have to charge it back to the people who are renting it to clean up now as far as the fis facilities I think if we're going to, as a board, keep it open for the next year or two, then we have to come up with costs or a budget for it. Uh, and I'm not suggesting a big budget, but if we're going to open it up for the next two years, then we have to have a certain amount of money allocated annually if the uh, toilets break or if the ceiling leaks or if the air conditioners don't work. Um, and if the air conditioners don't work and it's a multi or thousands of dollars fixed, then I think then and at that point, then we have to say no more. We can't do it anymore. I, but that would be my thought. I think we should keep it open, providing it's not costing the town money for the next two years, where until we make a decision and when whatever we're going to do with the building. Don't know if that helps or not. I like I like all these points that y'all make, and um, I am interested. Would it be helpful if we did restrict the size of the event that could be there? And the reason why I brought that up is just because wear and tear on the single toilet system that's there and, you know, if you have 200 people there, it's clearly going to have a much bigger impact um, disproportionately. It's going to, you know, 200 people is going to have more than four times the impact of 50 people. And I'm just wondering if that's something we should throw in the mix. You mentioned or not? I, 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 don't, I honestly could take don't know. Twenty flushes, or could take yeah, four hundred, right. or the air conditioner is going to break. Yeah, I honestly don't know. Twenty you know. people, or I'm just I, I throwing don't know. it out there. I'm not no, arguing with the other. It's just like that. This should be point. something we should throw in there. You know, I honestly don't know on this. I don't have a horse in this race. Yes. Uh, Paul Ship Ocean Drive. Are there any? Uh, is there enough uh, requests in the in the hopper to make it self-sustaining? Uh, to possibly get it to a point where 
with the fees that we charge that we can fix it a little bit and make it so that someone doesn't have to go out there? No? I don't think so. I think, I think I'll quote uh, David Friedman from many years ago and probably what I was thinking is, you know, the town's really not in the business of renting out facilities for private functions. We don't have the people for it. I think we all know at some point in time, the air conditioner's gonna break, you know, the rug's gonna tear, the bathroom's gonna fail, and you're gonna get a $2,000 bill that's gonna eat up any, any small amount of revenue that you made for, for a season. So I think you use it for public, or excuse me, for a town business, because you know what you're getting into at that point in time, but for the, for the private use, it's really not what we do. It's really, you know, we're, we're relying on people to come in and clean it. Then all of a sudden you'd have to get the fee to be at a level that people just won't want to use it for. You know, if you're going to have service master coming in and steam clean the rugs every day, and then you get people coming in knowing that they're paying for a cleaning service, so they take advantage of the facility and say, well, we're paying for a cleaner. You know, don't worry about picking that up or this up. So I just think, mm -hmm. you know, it's great. It's a luxury item, but it's not something that the town probably should be doing. Um, and it's really only benefiting a really small amount. And there's probably facilities around town that are that are upset that we're doing it. You know, you've right. got the inn, you've got uh, Barker Tavern, you've got the um, Beach uh, Association that has that building there. You know, there's other facilities around. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I lean towards, you know, wrapping up the private use of the building, using it for, for, pub, uh, for town functions. And um, because we're going to proceed on this quickly. I think phase one is going to take a heck of a lot longer than phase two is going to take. And I hope it's not two years before we get to, you know, I think as soon as you make a decision, if we decide to knock down the building, then that's going to take about a weekend, I imagine. Um, and then you start up with the next step. So uh, that's my opinion. Uh, go ahead, Joe. I, uh, just a thought, I, I agree with you. I think we should, we, we should, uh, grandfather in, that's the right word. Uh, <clears throat> all, everyone that has a permit in, in right. was now requested to us now. Set a limit of July 1st if there's nothing after that. And just yeah. Plus, they're not getting a great facility. You know, you feel you feel guilty charging somebody market rent when they're not getting, you know, a facility that's really up to market value. And we are, yeah, as you pointed uh, out, Mr. Chairman, I, yes, we, we, are, we are in competition by doing this, in competition with private businesses in town, whether it be Central Country Club, whether it be, well, you name them, so you were right. And I'm not sure we want to go down that road. The, the, let me just go back to, and I totally disagree with you too. Let me, all right, just use the, the, the uh, reunion for an example, okay? They, they're gonna come into town, they're gonna stay at the Clipper ship, all right? And then before the reunion, they're gonna go to the Mill Wharf, or they're gonna go to the Satua Tavern, and then the next night, they're gonna go back to the Clipper ship, and then they're gonna go to breakfast places around town. They're not gonna, they're not gonna rent Pier 44 instead of the Barker Tavern, because it's just totally different, you know? I'm just using that, I'm just- Are they gonna do more than $200 worth of depreciation to the asset? Maybe, charge them $600 then. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and, and <coughs> I'll do it. Well, you can I, have your reunion there. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I said the class of 70 is too tired. Hold on. One sec. I think, Kim, did you have something? Or? Well, I just was going to add a few more things that I, I, th I, I am going along with what you're saying, Tony and, and Joe, just because there are things that we haven't even thought of because we're not in the business of, 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 renting, it, of renting out facilities like this. Most places do have a caretaker on the premises during any function. To for for liability issues for I mean for preserving your 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 building I mean and, and we haven't even thought of that and that's a whole other expense. Also, there's a concern. I Paul and I have been working together really almost daily during our work week on um, liquor license um, matters and everything else. And somebody who has worked in the catering business and everything said, "Have you even thought about the fact that with high school and college graduations?" that you're gonna have underage drinking there and who is monitoring that type of thing. And that was honestly something mm -hmm. I, I hadn't thought it. of, but it, it is an issue. And we've had requests for that that I've denied just right. well, for, we got for that, that, that yeah. yeah. Nobody requested underage drinking. No, but, no, prom, but for prom, prom parties. Prom right. parties okay. no. I just wanted to be clear here, folks. And a prom party from another town. Yeah, right. Because it's like we're the cheap thing in town, but you know, that building isn't worth a $1,500 rental fee. 
especially if we can't guarantee that the air conditioning is going to work the whole night. Mr. Bagger, did you have? I was just going to say the conflict with uh, parties and uh, public use is that there are organizations such as the Recreation Department that now use it every Monday morning. Um, or uh, maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning for a class that they put on. And they've got people signed up, residents signed up, paid for this class. They come in Monday morning. And by the way, there was a party Saturday night. Now, party Saturday night probably did pay a clean deposit, but for a hundred bucks at 1 a.m., it's a lot easier to go home than to clean up. So who inspects it Sunday morning to make sure that it's cleaned up and, and ready for the, we had one situation where there was a, Perfectly wonderful uh, um, christening of a child a party on that Sunday afternoon. This class was going to use it on Monday morning, but there were a lot of children there. There was cake grounded in the floor. You know, uh, someone had pulled the fire alarm, and the fire department had to get there in time. And you know, we sent ambulances, and uh, well, rushed down there to see what was going on. But it was a child that pulled it, and yet the next Monday morning, 15 residents were going to show up to do their class they paid for. So it's, it's, a, it's a gross conflict. Um, two different uses that are not compatible. And the only other thing I want to say is what we really want to, to do, in addition to opening to boards and committees, is I've had to turn away the Boy Scouts for using it as meeting space or the food pantry for having some event there. Because we can't just give it away gratis without having you know, some sort of fee paid. And that, that's really hard because, you know, this community, I mean, we need meeting space, but again, we have no funds to, to, to operate it. So that's why we thought after Pier 44 came in tonight, we could talk to you about the, the other issue. John? So I guess one thought I have is, as a board, we have a consensus that we're willing to allow it to pr continue to uh, use it for town uses. It's just the issue of renting it to private parties. I agree with that. Right, because, I, I mean, we never stop that because we can stop town building, you know, town meeting uses at any time. But do we, have the, do we have a budget for town uses to be able to continue to use it and operate it going forward? If the toilets break or the air conditioning breaks, I guess you could say no longer using it we shut it down. We can pay for building improvements with the MBTA money. So the, the challenge has been that there's still electrical, oil, he, you know, heating costs for the building, whether it's open or closed. So, you know, meeting things are incidental to it. The cleaning charge, we're finding an unaccommodation to pay that biweekly and things like that. So there's certain fixed costs we eat, whether the building is open or closed as far as the utilities. Okay. And public meetings are probably less yeah. it's keeping taxing. It costs yeah. about 1200 a month to keep it heated and to keep it from freezing and from overheating. Okay. Um, and, you know, when town meetings occur in there, they just occur in there. Um, we shut it down on the weekends, except when it's an event, and then we have to go jigger for it. Um, so about it, the original starting point was, oh my goodness, we can't have it freeze that first winter. So we had to then get all the heating systems functioning. And then in the spring came along, we said, my gosh, it's smelling moldy in here, so we had to get all the <laughs> air conditioning functions functioning, okay? And then we had to we had to actually literally change the service centers because the the whole uh, electrical system had rotted out. And then, well, we need to have toilets, so then we had to put in a hot water heater for the toilets. And then, because some people are using it for food service, we had to put a hand wash sink in. in. So that was more plumbing. So yep. it's been one of these things. So now it's the point where it's eleven or twelve hundred a month, with the expectation that it will come to an end when you know we move to the next phase. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? So, as I think John was saying, we all agree that town usage and even maybe even expanding to town town services could use the building, but to eliminate the private use of the uh, facility after the current after uh, the current. I think your latest system. one is August. Is that the latest one? Well, request. Did we we only have, no, we no, we do not. We've only committed until so. till June thirtieth. There's a couple of requests that we're waiting for any decision that we're made. So those are not commitments? No. So until June? I know we've heard, if I may, I know we've heard that letter from the uh, reunion group. Class of 72. Hmm. <coughs> that included, I think, the... They I, no, I did not. Right. I did See, not that goes past that. July 1. I think right. it's in August. August. It's Heritage Day Heritage, weekend. Right. It's on Heritage oh, Day's weekend. Okay. 
well, do you want to include that one in it? And then we'll just <coughs> figure out what the fee is. We'll make it cost neutral. So what we'll figure out what the fee is to get a cleaning facility in to clean it properly. And um, yes. If you include the one for August, what about the three or four other ones that are waiting to hear back? What if we said? What if we said those that have a request in as of right now? Well, will, will well what are they though? Because we don't want any. Um, you that prom party is not. Yeah, there was a prom party, and there's a few other people that are going to call me tomorrow. They said I'm, I'm, you know, asking about it um, for a birthday party. One was a 40th birthday party that they wanted to do, and she and I said, well, you have to call me tomorrow when I know more because I don't know right now. What's the date? Oh. July. I would. Uh, I mean, I would say the, no. The other thing is, you know, some of these. I'm not going to decide whether 100 people go to the Harbor Community View with liquor and entertainment, what they'll have to have for you on Heritage Days. I mean, I I think that's a separate decision that the board makes, um, regardless of whether you want to go past July 1 or not. Why don't we say at this point in time, it ends at whatever we book so far in June. And if we want to make an exception to it, then then we can. Over the next couple of months, we'll figure out what we're going to do with the building, and then if the people want to have it in August, then they can come back and we can see what what the status of stuff is then. Or do you want to? And I and I'm fine with that, but I will also rely heavily on our professional town employees to give us their input as to whether the the burden is bearable or not on a particular thing like that. You know, I mean, because I could see something that might sound good to us, but it's like got all these ramifications and things that we're not even aware of that would just blow it out of the water for them. I think, I think it's, and I don't want to belabor this by any means, but I think it is important. We're just not in the function business, and, and, and we don't know how to do it. We haven't got the capabilities to do it. We haven't got the money to do it. We're not going to have a DPW director as of July 1st to go down there and, and, and check for cake in the rugs. You know, it's just not going to happen. We've been very fortunate, so I think that uh, yeah. you know, we, we, unless we're committed to to put another budget line and function manager, then we better curtail our operations. Down there. Do you need a sense of the board on this or a motion or no, what? No, I, I think it's, it's no, that's we're good. Are we all good on this? Yes. But that's fine. I mean, I, they, they don't have their application in. I wouldn't want to go too far down that road and then have them decide on another place in here. You know, I mean, I've just had some discussions with one of their class members. That That's all. So that sounds fair. Mr. Chairman, can you yes. just clarify the date? July what, have, what do we have? What's the latest uh, up to commitment? June 30th. We're accepting applications up to June 30th, not after. No more applications. No more after. After tonight. Time. We're done. To be, yeah. Whoever's booked, who's ever booked right now. I see. Yeah, I agree. Go ahead. Right? Who's ever booked right now right. to June 30th is in, but no one tomorrow, no one the next day. We're, we're out of the business. I thought you just said that this might be able to happen in August now or, or not. If I don't, I don't think they've formally put their application in. They've requested okay. through the Board of Selectmen, I believe. Um, yeah, we got an email. For the class of 72. Okay. Um, well, what's the sense? I would say, how many, pro there's like three parties left, right? For this year? Yeah, through June 30th that we've committed to. Yes. I would yes. say that's it. That, that would be my thought. Does anyone want to expand that? Uh, um, for the three parties that are left that have put requests in, that's what you're saying? Yeah. Keep them. I, I have no problems doing it. I mean, if this class from 72 were asking 77 or 82, I'd probably say no. <laughs> but I mean, now I think they're adult enough. I think they'd handle it. So. And coming back to situ would be good for them. I'd say let the class have their party and then we shut it down. I, I agree, but I don't think they're included in these three. Are they? No, yeah. they're not. Yeah. That's so, the problem. so we have to include those if we want. Well, if you do, you got to include the other four people yeah. that have that. That's what we have. Mm. So I'll tell you what, let's include the three for right now. We'll make a decision on what we're going to do with the building before then, within the next month. That'd and be then we'll figure out from there. If we decide we're going to keep the building, then we can start investing in the building and not feel bad about it. But if we go good put point. a new bathroom and now we're gonna knock it over in two months. Good point. Does that sound good? I'm confused. But the I three applications that are in right now. Realize are, that this one's oh, not one of them. So right. this is not okay. one of them. All right. So that's fine. All right. They'll have to wait for a month until we make a decision on second Oh, so phase. it's still possible. Yes. All is. right. Fine. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to item number ten. 
the final preparations for the town meeting. For sure. Um, I put a memo in your packet um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, anything you need from your offices or from staff to get ready or just sort of talk a little bit about um, certain articles or certain particular projects or um, priorities in the budget and Mark is here as well um, to participate in the discussion. The one thing I gave me a lot of feedback on and I've been standing in front of Village Market for a while in the last couple months um, is confusion about the $375,000 that we're allocating for the town-wide study of multiple buildings. And people, I think because of our wording, our inadvertent wording, we are, I think, using for shorthand uh, the wording like feasibility study, and it's actually not a feasibility study, and I think we need to be very careful of that because people are getting confused. They're saying, what do you need $375,000 for to study gates? We already know about gates. You just spent a certain amount of money on the gates feasibility study for. What do you need another 375000 to tell you about gates? When in reality, a 375 is for a whole town-wide assessment. It's not going to go to a single consultant right now that we have an RFP on the street for to do one study for. It's to allocate approval, to get pre-approval for a series of studies to see can the combined dispatch station go up to help mine it in the West End and can the, all these other things happen? And so when I explain it to people, then they completely flip around. They say, why the hell do you think you can do that for 375000 So the same person who five minutes earlier might be saying, what do you need 375 for for that? Then they turn around and they go, Jesus, I don't think you're going to do it for that amount of money. So I think we just really, as a board, need to get out to people and we should just personally stop using the phrase feasibility study because it gets it confused um, with that Gates other study. And this is for the whole town grand plan, uh, multiple consultants through the time frame and so on. So that's, that's the one thing that I'm you know, worried about in terms of making sure people know what's going on. So in your opening remarks and in our conversations with our good friends in the press, I think that's something we need to, to really market and push push out there well that's clearly one of the few um, uh, earmarked items that is that is on this warrant yeah um, you know people ask what where did we get the number and the number was just picked as a as a number a best guess estimate based on the amount of money that we have available in our capital plan um, and it's really there in place so that we can make progress in trying to figure out whether this is doable or not so that we don't have to keep going back to town meeting and saying we need fifty thousand dollars for this consultant get that done and then wait another six months to go to a special town meeting and say I need thirty five thousand dollars to do this engineering to see if can where can gates go here and and what's the architectural layout for this or what uh, feasibility study or not feasibility the um, structural study for the other sections of gates that we didn't do so you can't just go to one facility as Rick said and say can you give us a quote for all this work because it's going to be multiple things and it's going to be in stages and it's going to be overlapping so that it's um, um, you know it's really a pool of funds that we can draw on to move this progress along quickly um, because we don't want to be waiting you know several years or decades to see if whether this project's going to go in place we want to find out after the annual town meeting and by the next annual town meeting be ready to move on it I think is the goal of the board um, again it's not feasibility study but it is to see whether it will work and actually get schematics and get actually design work and get actually engineering done on different areas um, and we'll probably need more money maybe at some point in time at which we'd have to go back at a special and and ask for that and at that point in time it may be more specific in terms of we need a hundred grand for this or 40 grand for that um, Trish, is there anything we've left out on that that you can think of on that one item? I mean, no, I think you put put survey, surveying, site analysis, appraisals, cost estimating, uh, anything that would help if positioning um, the future school, be a renovation or a new school um, through the school department with MSBA, um, potential reuse of properties that would be vacated or um, um, you know sold and programming costs for like they talked about a lot of what they talked about tonight in terms of phase one phase two 
um, what's the best, you know, how do we go about what's the best use, what are the needs, those kinds of things. Right. So if you support this initiative that we have heard support of, this is the first step of funding the activities that need to take place in that phase one um, process to see if, if it is functional and how much it will cost to actually do it, which will be phase two to say, okay, all these pieces can go in place. We have the reports that support it, and it's going to cost the town, you know, $3 million to do it. I mean, could we have like a flyer that we have handed out so people grab out and it's just, you know, eight and a half by 11. It says, what is the 375 for? It's for it the anniversary. For this, or? We picked the number because of the anniversary, 375. Right. But <laughs> what is the, one. but no, but what, what are some of the potential things that could go to? Well, just the so advisory people have book it there? Maybe. The advisory report writes up comments as to those items. That it does? Yeah. Okay. I think we're, we're too hung up on, on I, I think, number. yeah, you, you're going to have to explain it anyways. Yeah. Yeah. We're all on board with yeah. that. I'm just talking marketing. If it's less, the money goes back to the right. to the town. Right. If it's more, then we'll have to right. come again for more money. Um, but again, as Mark's saying, it's conceptually. If you if you don't support the um, potential upgrading of all, of our facilities including gates, including town hall, including the police, fire, possibly the library, possibly council on aging, all these other components. Um, if this gets voted down, then we can't even take the next step into, into that process. Yeah. I think you're going to be subject to criticism no matter what. They're going to say it was an arbitrary number, and I think that is not the case. Uh, we, we can put it forth now. If it gets printed that way, great. I hope it, it's printed so it's explained to people. Some people aren't going to read it. They're going to come to town meeting and right away are going to say, what is this number? Why is this? So we'll have to just cogently go, get up and explain it. And um, hopefully we can um, convince them to, to support it. Um, but, but I think really you're right. No, yeah, there's no more explanation yeah. than what we're giving you now. It's Correct. not like we're going to have a list at town meeting that says 50 for this, 40 for this, 100 for this, 80 for this. Right. You know, it's it's really a pool of money to draw on so that we can start taking the steps, um, you know, for this function. Right. Right. Great. Um, another another item that is unique to this um, warrant is the uh, um, the ESCO project that we've that we've undertaken. Initially, it was for three hundred thousand dollars. Since that time, we've approved a project for five point nine million dollars. And what this is doing is, is it's, it's looking for the authorization for the town to start proceeding with these projects. It's not for a $5.9 million purchase. It's for the town to be able to have access to projects up to that amount. And then every year what we'll do is in our capital plan process, we'll say we're going to do, uh, there's a whole list of projects of which 5.9 million, it's specifically for buildings that aren't in play in terms of our previous discussed um, article, but there's 3.9 or 3 point something million dollars worth of school stuff, uh, another 1 point whatever million dollars worth of stuff from town buildings that need to be repaired that have come across to us as, as um, um, in poor condition and, and come across to us that will generate some sort of savings that will help fund the project. So. As an explanation, we've partnered up with a company that has come in and literally guaranteed the savings on utility fees for different projects. I'll take one for example, let's say a boiler at Wapatuck or pick a school. Um, they're saying that if you take $200,000 and put it in to fix this boiler, that it will pay for itself through its utility expenditures over 20 years. So there'll be twenty thousand or ten thousand dollars worth of utility savings for that purchase and that installation, and they've guaranteed that. So what we do is we now um, we finance that purchase and we try and tie up, uh, match up the finance payments with the cost savings or the expense savings, so that there's a zero cash effect on our town and on our operating budget, and. Um, and that's what all of these projects are. They all pay for themselves over some period of time. The initial projects that we would choose would be the low-hanging fruit, where they say, if you change these light bulbs for $1,000, it'll pay for itself in two years. And those are the types of things. So every year we'll come before the town and say, there's um, $722,000 worth of ESCO projects that we want to proceed with this year. 
and we'll go with them and we'll we'll show how the uh, the expense savings and the cost of it will tie against each other and hopefully make it a zero sum game in terms of cash and operational impact. Was that right? Does that sound good? Perfect. I learned a lot last week. <laughs> I, I, dry run. I, yeah. I think uh, what it all comes down to these items and also the facilities manager is also is relatively new uh, in the budget. Uh, it's, it's, well, if the townspeople want to, to fix the buildings, school buildings and town buildings, then they have to go in this direction. If, if they want the, billion, the buildings to continue to go downhill and to cost us more money in the long run, they can vote no. But the, if, if, we all we all know hopefully they do also that the buildings are in deplorable condition in some cases they're an actual safety hazard to the children of this town uh, and if you want to fix them you have to vote yes on this project if, if you don't that's another story vote no Sean? you've touched on it perfect the guarantee and then the low-hanging fruit i heard yeah. trisha say all those times and that that's so important you said it so good that's that was it any other comments on that? So again, this is a, a, a venture or a, 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 a partnership that we've got with this company that's going to come in, guarantee these savings, and it will help the town. And it will, you know, as Joe was saying, for the past, you know, 375 years, we've taken our money and we've we've put so much focus on our operations and really so little focus on the assets of the town in terms of the infrastructure and the buildings. And um, you know, and our and our sewer systems and these sort of things. And now you can kind of sense over the last couple of years that we're kind of turning our attention to those things because they're getting to a bad condition and a bad spot. And um, you know, schools and public buildings and infrastructure and roads and seawalls all need attention that they've desperately needed for decades. Okay. Next. Yes, Kelly. Um, so I guess. Year, um, if you're going to come back to it every year anyways. Well, the reason would be, town let's say, for instance, um, we pick three projects that they think that they can do within X period of time, and it costs $700,000, and we start going with those projects. And one of them gets done quickly, and the next one is $120,000 that they found somebody that can do that will either coincide with it or start before another end of a time period. We can just keep having access to these funds to keep the projects going one on top of each other and side by side to get them done as quickly as possible. Otherwise, you know, you have the time delays of having to keep going back to town meeting for every single project. Aside from the fact that we went in with this group and we paid them, well, we didn't pay them, but they did an audit that showed that these are the needs and we had to commit to a level of, a level of work with them. And that's that's what we've done. We, they gave us what was it three different plans that we could go with, and we chose this plan, um, and that's that's what we've committed to. Let me try conceptually, okay, for for residents. If you own a house and you realize, hey, guess what? I need to fix the windows, the roof, maybe um, redo some work in a bathroom or kitchen or something. You say, okay, the total cost is going to cost me maybe about ninety-five thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars. Pick a number. Well, you don't want to go to the bank every time and say, you know, I'm going to start this project. I'll take a $20,000 loan and then say, okay, we'll give you a mortgage for a second mortgage. Then you go back and you say, I think I need another one. I'm going to get a third, mo a, a, a sec a third mortgage. The bank's not going to offer it. You'd say, hey, guess what? Can I get a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, up to $100,000? I'm not going to use it all up, but I'll use it piecemeal to get my project when I can afford to do it. And I think yeah. maybe conceptually people can understand that better instead of having to keep going back and say, can I get another mortgage? Can I get another mortgage? Because at some point they're going to say, no, you have to refinance the whole thing. And it's a lot easier to be able to say, maybe I can get an equity line of credit to be able to do it and get authorized for it. So is there a first year plan of like, OK, this, in this first year that this is authorized, we're going to do these, we're going to change labels, or we're going um, to? Yes. Yes and no. Yes and no. We haven't identified a, a number, I guess. Um, the school committee has the list. Um, also, within the ESCO recommended plan, it doesn't say you must uh, replace the heating system using this brand heating system for this amount of BTUs. It sometimes has three or four options, so the town gets to choose which system it wants to go in. So we provided that to the school to have them 
look at which schools cause, and which um, things they want to do the first year coupled with our list and then we pretty much know what we want to do the first and second year with a combination of immediate short term savings but also some longer term savings that would go 10 or, or 20 years out right. right right so we haven't we have the list we just haven't picked the 10 things that we're gonna do plus we need them to come back to us with their cost analysis that says okay if you do this project here's the timetable and here's how we're gonna match the savings with the costs so like I said it's not gonna have a big impact on our operational budget and that's I guess, right and I just want to and it's so folks are clear the town has already completed an audit of every single municipal and school building and that company that we hired to do that has completed that and has recommendations for every single town and school building the town and school department get to choose when and how those are done and over what period because they all have different paybacks and they all have different um, repay periods. And completion time periods. Yeah. You know, if you're going yeah. to replace all the windows in gates, that could take a year to do, but to, re you know, to replace, you know, the doors in town hall or the lighting fixtures could take a week. And just to clarify, this is coming from capital? It would be borrowing, yeah. Under yep. the, it's under the capital plan article four. Right. Okay. And right. my other question, you said guaranteed. Does that mean that if these things don't generate the savings, that they will pay the town? Yes. Okay. Yes. Contractually obligated. Okay. So this isn't just, I guarantee it. Yeah. Okay. This is a signature. And that's why you get that actual spreadsheet on every project that says, we guarantee $10,408 worth of savings. Is that specific? Yes, yes, it yeah. is. Like I just read in today's paper, I gave it to Al. The city of Portland has Amoresco, which is our, con our company. Um, they did a 17-year um, bond for $9.6 million, and their first year savings was $879,000. I did it in Springfield before I came here. I think our estimated savings in year two, much bigger uh, community, obviously, was in excess of $25 million. So, um, But don't let... You're yeah. not going to save that money. Those savings is just going to pay for the debt to do the work. So your your utilities will go down, and you'll right. have your you'll have will residual right. savings from that. But initially, it's just going to pay for replacing that boiler. Right. You said you only had one problem. So is this? <laughs> no, this is no, this is good because we we need to have this out. So I'm ask, I feel ask for last day. We have to tease her a little. Is, is it this working? Like is it really? So How first of all, yeah, it's not a feasibility study. We just want to get that right. But the whole master plan of our buildings, and that's why we chose the plan that was 5.9 million and not 7.9 million, because we didn't choose the buildings that we're considering doing work on. Getting rid of. Right. Yeah. So there's so much work outside of Gates, Town Hall, the Fire Department, the Police Department, <coughs> that those are the things we're focused on to start. Are those the only four exceptions? No, no, no. Maybe. probably not council no. on age and there's others no I mean th what Tony says is we've already identified those projects that we know are going to be here five years from now and we're going to be having a town or school function with them anything else the senior center town hall the police station the fire station um, gate school is not in that mix of identified initial projects if we don't get the funding for the next steps in terms of design and engineering if the community doesn't want to be move forward mm -hmm then we need to be ready to position ourselves to make those improvements in those buildings that are not going to change for the next five years. That may be um, town hall, police, and fire, but might not be the Council on Aging, the library, or gates. So that's why the key word for the ESCO is flexibility, um, to be able to be able to move in the direction we need to dep dependent on the different outcomes. And there may be some years where we do minimal repair. Yep. You know, we may say we're only going to do one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of right. projects this year. There's no, there's no timeline that you have to get it completed within, you know, three years or what have you. But this five point nine million, will that cover you for five years, or do you expect to come back next town meeting and say we're going to replenish this amount? Well, it's it's, it's actually covers projects. Right. So there's a booklet that has five point nine million dollars worth of projects. Okay. Right. And so the town is asking town meeting to authorize and not to exceed. 
up to $5.9 million for this program. That's a multi-year program, but that it also gives us the flexibility we already talked about. Any idea what length of time that is, multi-year? Every project has a different timetable for the payment. When what might this be exhausted? Four, 15 five. to 20 years, I think. No, I think she's it. thinking more just to complete them, not when it will be amortized. You know, probably over the next five to seven years, we'll want to get through that yeah, $5.9 uh, yeah, million. Yeah, I would dollars. say five, five years, probably. Yeah, that's sort Again, of it also depends on our bandwidth to be able to manage it mm -hmm. right. and uh, take on, I mean, it's like CPC. We get new CPC projects every year that we need to fold in the management and the administration of. This is going to be the same thing. If we have capacity to do... 10 projects, we will. If we only have capacity to be able to effectively manage two, then we're going to be limited by that. What a perfect transition to one of the other um, additions to the budget this year as a facilities manager. Um, we tried to get this position in place six months in advance at the <coughs> special town meeting, and it didn't pass. But this is a position that the town needs for all of the reasons that we've been talking about, as well as just the other projects that the town um, goes goes through in terms of CPC stuff, in terms of betterment projects, in terms of um, just really knowing what the f what the status of all of our buildings are. What, how many buildings and fifty five fifty five buildings and fifty five buildings hundred million dollars worth fifty million hundred fifty million dollars worth of assets. So um, this position is in this budget. Um, it was essentially what happened was it was eliminated about two or three years ago when we uh, looked at the DPW department and cut several positions. Um, and what we're really doing is just reinstating a position in DPW that was cut previously um, under this job title and of facilities manager. It. And yeah, upgrading. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's not just bringing back. Right. I think it's actually a position, but yeah, not wouldn't that really, position. Yeah, that's not really accurate. I mean, you know, we did have some capability to do the day-to-day -day <laughs> oversight. No, but you know what I mean? No, I don't. But, <laughs> I mean, one of the questions that I've been getting is, you know, this is another $85,000 expense and we can't afford it. And that's really not how the position's been crafted in the budget. We cut other municipal departmental requests this year in order to be able to make that our, our number one priority. And um, that's what we do in the budget. It's not that we're adding 85000 We've reduced increases in other budgets to be able to accommodate that. And I think that's a, a real important point. Um, and the other thing that I need to say is, you know, this isn't sort of empire building on the town side. Or, or we haven't, you know, we're down 14 full-time positions since 2008. And this is in addition to the IT director that filled a crucial need Eat, and we create, carved out the money to do that when we had the worst budget situation I think the town had seen in many years. Mm -hmm. In order for ESCO and the, mm -hmm. the design and next step plans and Pier 44 and just general building oversight, I, I, it's like the linchpin to everything that we're going to do to go forward. And frankly, we're not doing a great job right now with our buildings and with <coughs> our projects. And what I meant to say, or I did say earlier, is there, there used to be more people in the DPW department three years ago yeah. that were, were able to assist with this. At and, least in um, the day-to-day, -to -day too. Yeah. yeah. And there they were eliminated a few years ago. Are there any other key points for the... Uh, Mark, do you have any other that you've been getting feedback on that you think... No, uh, I have not. Um, I was curious if any of the other members have recommended points or not. Uh, keep them working, but if I think we've covered them all for me. Other than the items we've already talked about. Nothing else, really. Is 85000 what it was last year? Yes. It's um, um, just in the immediate area. Marshfield and Hanover created those positions in the last two years. Um, the actual Marshfield um, facilities director was supposed to um, join us tonight, but um, was unavoidably detained. So, um, but if we get a monthly publication of municipal jobs and this job in communities is probably being advertised you guys see them at least two or three communities a month um, just because they're doing ESCO they're being green communities they have turbines um, and and they also have facility and maintenance needs right. and just so there's no confusion what we tried to do is get this position in place six months in advance so on at the special town meeting it was only for half of that because we were just looking to fund the position before the annual town meeting. And that's why 
uh, like Tricia said, now she's found a spot for this in the current budget under the current structure, you know, of the forecast. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I notice here in going through the advisory booklet is there are 17 um, CPC articles before the town again. So I, I'm not going to go through them now, but I would recommend that you get the booklet and look at it beforehand so that you're um, prepped on this. There's purchase of open space. Uh, you know, the largest one is about a half a million dollars worth of open space um, in the West End. Is it possible that whether it's the Mariner or the Globe or even the Ledger, could you at least put on the advisory booklet, at least online, because so people could take a look at it? It's a, it's a wonderful piece of inform, uh, information packet that can answer a lot of questions. And I, I, you know, if you can get it online, it would be the advisory booklet. Kim's going to get them copies now, but the whole town budget's posted online, too. But the advisory, I think, advisory is helpful program. because it really explains yeah, it right. and it tells it. Is the advisory yeah. on, the, right. on the town's website? Yep, it's right along with the, the budget. Oh, that's right, it is. It's posted at the same time, same spot. That's right. right. The only other thing that, I, that I'd add in terms of the discussion of the budget in the, in the articles is last year, and this kind of goes to back what Joe and I were talking about a minute ago in terms of the capital and the infrastructure of the town. Last year in the override, the town um, allocated Four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars worth of that override money to fixing the infrastructure of the roads and the seawall, and that is in place again this year. So every year there's going to be that chunk of money that's going to go from the town side operating budget to the infrastructure of the town, and whether it's in terms of seawalls and road repair, and that is in this budget as well. So. Um, those are really the other ones that you have revolving funds and all the regular type stuff but yeah annual stuff but there's nothing else really too off the norm unless you guys can think of anything else mark anything else how about you guys did you see any yes I had a couple of questions um, maybe it's a question for Chief Stewart but are they increasing security to spend is that part of the budget Yes, there's additional, um, he had actually requested that in the FY12 budget, but um, the, the override provided for additional public safety folks, and that's allowed us to increase the summer complement, which will in turn allow us to increase enforcement of the SPIT. All right, and has there been uh, anything with the fire contract? We have not received the arbitration award from the Joint Labor Management Committee yet. Um, we've had, we have some contingency planning, but until we get that award, it's hard to, to, you know, comment further. Great. Kelly, anything? Do you have anything you want to tell us? <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, this is my last meeting. <laughs> Good, <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Good luck, Kelly. <laughs> And there'll be a new, do you know who's taking your spot? Uh, yep, she's the reporter in Hanover and Norwell. Oh, good. Great. Awesome. All right, we'll move on to item number 11, 11 which is? Other business. Other business. Any other business? I'll pass. Just have one thing. Uh, I did attend that, uh, that dinner last, uh, last week. Uh, I was honored Linda Whitney of Wampatec School and Amy uh, Caldera teaches first grade in, in Wampatec School, and they were honored for the work that Amy did with her class in raising funds for uh, the, the Patriot Ledger's program, uh, Linda Hand program. Mm -hmm. A great organization. They, 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 they were uh, loudly applauded and cheered. They did a great job, the kids and, and the principal and the teacher accepted the award. And, for the children, so it was nice to see the school getting that recognition. Thank you. Rick, anything? Two things. One, it's been nice seeing that windmill turning <laughs> the last couple of days. So the windmill is generating power as of last Friday, so that's always lovely to see. Um, and then I mentioned this last week to y'all, but just so you got the time, but the Seaport Advisory Council is actually meeting this Thursday at the Maritime Center, and the time is 10.30, and uh, Lieutenant Governor is going to be there. I'm going to say some words. Tony, if you're going to be there, you can say some words. Anybody else wants to come down and be welcome, but that's quite a coup for the town to be able to host this with all the other mayors and port officials of Gloucester and New Bedford coming to Little Old Sitcher. 1030 Thursday morning at the yeah, Maritime Center. I'll be Center. there. I might be a little late, but I'll Trish be there. Will be there. Okay. Yeah, just a few. Um, it's Saturday 
uh, April 28th at 10 a.m. There's going to be the Candidates Forum that's sponsored by the uh, Chamber of Commerce. It's going to be at the GAR on Country Way. So uh, that's uh, April 28th, 10 a.m. in the morning. Second, uh, the 28th is actually also Ship Shape Day. So um, I, I don't think we have another meeting before. Do we have one before the 28th, Kim? Just downtown hall. Okay, so just so people understand that Ship Shape Day, I forgot exactly when they come to town hall. Does it say? Saturday the 28th at? It's usually like around 9 or 10. 8, eight to 1. It's 8 a.m., 8 in the morning till, till 1, to pick up bags and things to go to different sections. So if you could also report that, it would be also helpful. Um, and I believe the 22nd, if I'm not mistaken, is the, um, in conjunction to what uh, Rick Murray was saying, we're going to have a... Um, a celebration for the wind turbine down at Driftway Park um, and I believe there will be various officials, various people who have actually been active in doing this for the past six years and a commemoration of, of, of turning the turbine. Um, one other thing, Tricia, if, if there's a possibility, um, could Chief Stewart take a look or give us, give me at least a, a, a report? There are a number of break-ins recently uh, in Sand Hills, uh, Friday to be exact, but there have been a number of car break-ins. and. Um, just a lot of people in my neighborhood are, are basically saying they've been broken into, and it seems like a disproportionate number. And if, if they could either do, increase some policing at night or something, that would be extremely helpful. 14. Thank you. What's that? 14 cars. 14. There you go. And then six more to each Right. Thank you. I've gotten the same phone call, so <laughs> thank you. John? Along with uh, Trisha, along with what John said, next time you get down, Driftway, yeah, and I was just telling Joe, go by the old animal shelter, yeah, mm -hmm. and look on the on the street side of the fence. Oh yeah, it's going to oh, keep someone gross. busy for a week. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, that's a lot to ask of the volunteers to go through there. You know, it's been blowing over on the C and D stuff, but it, it it's just awful looking. You know, and then in a few weeks there'll be leaves. You won't be able to get at it. Trashes. Okay. Thanks. Right. Thanks, John. And the only thing that I'll add is that next Monday night is the annual town meeting at the high school seven o'clock get there early get a good seat um, lots of stuff to talk about and we want you there we want your feedback um, and we want to um, go over the items on this if you if you have uh, questions on stuff read the uh, advisory booklet and come in and raise your hand that being said, we'll we'll adjourn. <laughs> second. Second by Mr. Murray. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. I, I asked Joe. All right. Just one other quick thing. The Easter egg hunt is uh, this Saturday. Recreation holds it at Widow's Walk Golf Course. It's at eh, somewhere around 10, I think. 10 o'clock. Uh, don't be late, though, because there's no parking. And they are going to let the kids go after the egg. So get there early, find some parking, and enjoy the Easter egg hunt. They don't have it up on the side of the transfer station.